miss anything, why don't you share your screen and take it away? Thank you, Boris. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. That it's, um, it's, it's, I think, a very exciting um, summer school. Um, yeah, so let me share the screen. And, uh, Can everyone see? Great. So, uh, okay. So let's start. And um, I, I would like to um, sort of start this with a little bit of um, a discussion of uh, why. Uh, why do we need a deep learning summer school? Why do we need theory of deep learning? So the, and what, why is deep learning theory different from the sort of statistic theory or machine learning theory, which we have, um, you, you know, uh, which have existed for many years. And in a sense, the point is that it's not really different. The point, at least from my point of view, is that uh, the success of deep learning has brought to surface issues which have existed or lack of understanding which has existed in this uh, more traditional um, areas for a long time. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is this um, is will be based on this um, kind of review or position paper which um, I wrote recently. So, uh, well, as we know, uh, deep learning has been very successful empirically in the last, uh, maybe, let's say, 10 years. And the underlying structures of this um, object that we have in deep learning are really rather complex. You know, we have, you know, structures like this with essentially millions of para parameters and hyperparameters, so many parameters, but also many ways to train them, uh, annealing schemes, lots and lots of different things. So how do we make sense of this? And how do we sort of try to understand it in a little bit more fundamentally, um, fundamentally sort of principled way? And the sort of, you can say that there has been a crisis of machine learning theory. And um, the, the, there are two aspects of this. On one hand side, there was um, the argument that machine learning has become alchemy. Um, from Ali Rahimi and Ben Rech gave this um, very nice talk at um, NIPS 2017. Uh, they basically said that uh, machine learning existed this pre-scientific state where you know you mix different ingredients and you sometimes get good results, but you don't know which results are leading to the success, or what part of it are important for the success of the enterprise. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is, as Jan LeCun argued, is that um, theory is essentially irrelevant because it doesn't explain the right things. It's um, the analogy is with um, looking for lost keys on the lamppost because where the light is, right? Instead of looking for the actual place where you may have lost the keys, right? You're looking where the light is because that's where you can see things. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, theory doesn't really help because, well, it's dealing with mathematical objects which somehow have no um, particular relevance to the phenomena we observe. Um, so what's the uh, underlying nature of this crisis and what is the sort of recognition of the crisis? Uh, and I, I should point out that, uh, you know, Jan, of course, said on 
many occasions that deep learning essentially breaks some rules of statistics, presumably meaning that we don't do the same thing, that we don't have good theory to understand what it is, and maybe even making a strong argument that theory is irrelevant, um, not needed maybe, I don't know. Um, the, however, the nature of this is actually the, the sort of, if you look at this historically, the, this is a much older story. And the story goes back to at least uh, around 20 years ago, when Leo Breiber, the prominent statistician from Berkeley, wrote um, this short note called Reflection After Referring Papers for Dips, when he basically said that there seemed to be conflicting story regarding the following issues. And one of the issues is uh, why don't heavily parameterized neural network horror feeds the data? And where should you stop back propagation and things like that? Essentially, the same, um, the same questions we're dealing with now. So, I guess the interesting part of this is even like like this has clearly existed for at least twenty years, or close to twenty years. But why now? And I think recently, it has become more clear that these issues need to be resolved. Be because of the empirical success of deep learning. And when you have something which is so successful, you somehow cannot have this outstanding issues theoretically or, or sh shouldn't. Yes. From my point of view, of course, I believe that theory can explain a lot of what's happening. And um, hopefully what I'll present is shed some light on those issues. So there are two questions and the Two key questions are the following. The first is a question of generalization. And essentially the question is, why do neural networks generalize to unseen data? And you can take it more generally and to ask the question, why do machine learning methods and general models generalize to unseen data? And what we'll discuss soon, we'll sort of start with taking a look at the classical analysis of this due to optic and then see why uh, what was the problem that, uh, you know, uh, Leo Breiman and Jan Le uh brought up? Uh, the second one is optimization. And the question is, why can non-convex objective function be optimized by methods like gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent? And I, I should say that the first question, generalization, I think it's still a question which is not fully resolved. And perhaps it's a more fundamental question for the reason that I think optimization now we can say that we are close to understanding why the things can be optimized, but we are probably not, not yet quite close to fully understanding generalization. And also for machine learning, the fundamental question is generalization. And uh, Next, I would like to sort of say just a couple of words why I call it a prism. And uh, so there is a common expression of viewing something through a lens uh, of such and such. Um, I think a prism in this case is a more uh, appropriate analogy because what does a lens do? A lens magnifies, right? Or it concentrates light. Uh, in this case, we don't actually want to magnify things, right? Because magnifying details of the architecture of a neural network is not going to be helpful. They're going to be even more complicated than they actually magnify them. What we want to do, we want to reduce things. And what does a prism do, right? The prism takes light, which is a combination of different colors, and it splits it into individual colors. So it's making analysis of something which is complex possible by splitting it into simpler components, like light of individual colors. And, um, there is a um, uh, John Keats, a famous uh, 19th century poet, complained that uh, uh, Newton of physics destroyed the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to prismatic colors. And that's what we kind of want to do with the learning architectures. We want to reduce them to some sort of individual components that we can understand. So, okay, so now let's get to the actual problem. And the key problem and the first one I would like to discuss is the problem of generalization. 
And in the simplest case, let's just take the classification setting. You have data and your data are just pointed some space, xi, just, just say that it's in RD for, you, you know, for something definite. And why are our labels? In the simplest case of binary classification is just minus one and one, or zero and one, whatever is more convenient. And for regression, of course, the labels will be real bad. Now, the goal is, um, it's a kind of an interesting goal, right? Because the goal is to take this data and to, contrast, uh, to construct a function from the feature space RD to R or to minus one, one, if we just want to do strictly classification, the best generalizes to unseen data. And it's a really interesting um, sort of setup, right? Because you want to take something some, some finite set of data that you have, and you want to, cons to generalize to something which you haven't seen before. It's um, sort of essentially predicting the future. And um, sort of to think about it more mathematically, the usual way we set it up, I mean, the problem is really fundamental, right? It deals with any sort of prediction when you pose it like this. But of course, we would like to pose it in a mathematically tractable way. The usual way to think about it is that we have some probability distribution over the data. And the optimal function is a function that minimizes the expected loss of unseen data. And the loss function is for classification. So L of f x y for classification is simply one if f of x is not equal to y. So usually if we want to predict, if we want to bet the optimal classifier, we want to have one which makes the fewest mistake in the future. And another one which is used for regression is the square loss. So notice there is actually quite frequently confusion here because this is the this is the loss function I'm using for testing, not for training. And for training, I may be I may use one. In fact, it's always done in practice. For example, nobody ever uses the zero one. The the zero one. This is called zero one loss. Uh, the zero one loss for actual uh, training. So. The trading and testing loss functions can be quite different. I, I usually prefer, it, except for the square loss. Uh, okay, so be it as it may, so most algorithms, and I presume that uh, you know it's a sort of a repetition. I presume that everybody has seen this in some form. Um, so now most algorithms. Uh, in practice and in particular neural network um, based on something called empirical risk minimization. And the empirical risk minimization actually looks kind of similar to the previous one, but instead of taking the expected loss, you take the empirical loss. And the empirical loss is simply the loss on your trading data. So you take all of your trading data, you construct the loss function, and then you try to minimize the function in some class of functions to make this loss as small as possible. Notice in the previous one, I didn't actually have any class of functions here. It was just the function. I mean, you could say it's an L2 or something, but it's really not that relevant what the class of functions is here. But in this case, the class of function is very, very relevant. And arguably, this is the key question. How do you choose? this class of function over which to minimize the loss. And we will first discuss the sort of classical view of this. And then I, I think the nature of the problem facing deep learning or facing machine learning as applied to deep learning will become much more clear. So if you look at the classical view of this, you um, see something like this. This is 
uh, U-shaped generalization curve. And the way to think about it is that this is small, small, um, the class of functions H is small, and here this is large H. And you are increasing, you are expanding your class of functions that you use for fitting the data. And the idea is that uh, as you increase model complexity, your training loss goes to zero or decreases because well, with more functions, you can fit your training data better. That's pretty clear. But your test loss go through this U-shaped curve. And on the left of this curve, you have underfitting when your model is not good enough to fit the data. On the right, you have overfitting. What is overfitting? Well, essentially the idea is that you're fitting noise rather than fitting the data. You somehow have so much expressive power that you are fitting the spurious correlations or spurious features of the data. And the goal is to find the sweet spot, which is the bottom of this U curve, somehow between underfitting and overfitting. To think about it from a more theoretical point of view, um, you can think of the following. So goal of machine learning is to find this um, minimizer of the expected loss. While the goal of empirical risk minimization, which is this optimization procedure that you have, is to find the minimum loss of a class of function over a class of functions on your trading data. And the Vapnik's idea, the, the theory of empirical risk, so it's actually structural risk minimization, but I'll mostly refer to it as empirical risk minimization. That's um, how it's referred to usually, uh, is the following. Is that basically, if you want to have a theory, so what he called the theory of induction, which is the same as theory of generalization, it's based on uniform law of large numbers. That's one. And second, effective method of inference must include capacity control. So I will discuss these two things and then we will see how Vaptic theory comes together. It's actually quite elegant. So first let's discuss uniform law of large numbers and second we'll talk about capacity control. So how does uniform law of large numbers work? Well, first, what is the law of large numbers, right? The law of large numbers, if you have a coin and you, you know, suppose it's a fair coin, right? Then uh, you lose one on heads and you uh, win one on tails, right? And if you throw it a bunch of times, you will get close to the expected value, which is zero. And if you, you know, if you look at the, um, um, uh, the, the deviation of that, you will see that the deviation you get expected value plus or minus something which is like square root of the number of tosses. And if you divide this by the number of uh, tosses, right, you get the expected value plus or minus one over square root of n. That's concentration. Um, so now you can have a uniform law of large numbers which means that the same thing holds over a class of functions rather than a fixed function. And it works like this. It says that if you have the empirical loss, right, it's uh, assuming that xi and yi are sample ID and uh, its usual statistical assumptions, right, that loss is just a random variable. And you are looking at this one away and uh, some of the trading data, right? The losses, it's just expected value on your trading data. It's the empirical loss. And this is the expected loss. And uniform laws of large numbers say that for um, any f in this class of function, expected loss is approximately equal to the empirical loss. Okay? And how different it is? Well, if you have some measure of complexity, and Waptic, of course, introduced the VC dimension of that particular, particularly important measure of complexity, particularly elegant one, you get something like the deviation is of the order of square root of C over N, when N is the number of data and C is this measure of complexity. 
Uh, the, there may be other terms, but um, that, that's the first order, it's just this. Uh, now, uh, if you have this, right, then you know that you can connect your expected loss and the empirical loss for not just for any function on the class. So you don't care about the any function of the class, right? What you care about is actually the function which minimizes your empirical loss. But this function is also a member of your class. And since this is a uniform law of large numbers, right? You apply the same thing. So notice already here that I'm getting something for this F star RM, but I'm not using properties of F star ARM itself, right? I'm using something about the class of function H. Okay, and please don't ask any, um, any questions and um, maybe I, once in a while I should stop and take questions. Uh, so in any case, so there is a property of this class of functions which allows us to say something about F star RAM. And you can see this is kind of a beginning of a little crack here because, well, you can say, well, I don't actually care about H, right? What I care about is F, this F star RAM. And remember F star RAM is the one which minimizes the empirical loss. But I am somehow not using the fact that it's minimizing the empirical loss here. I will, we'll talk about this more. Uh, now, so that was the uniform law of large numbers. The second part, remember the capacity control, which is a structural part of structural risk minimization. And essentially it's a really simple thing. It just says that my class of functions H contains functions which approximate optimal F star. And it's clear that I need something like that because if I don't have anything which is even close to the optimal solution, how could I hope to get anything reasonable at all? So this is very sort of intuitively necessary thing. And what Wapnik showed and built this theory is that uniform law of large numbers plus capacity control implies generalization of F star F. And let, let me give you a kind of a simple uh, argument for why this is true without sort of writing down all the details. Um, so for simplicity, assume that F star, the best predictor is actually an H. I don't have to assume it, it's enough for me to say that there is something in H which approximates F star, but it makes it simpler so I don't have to worry about the level of approximation. So, okay, so then what do we have? We have first from the uniform law of large numbers we know that L star, uh, L empirical, the empirical loss of F star RM is approximately equal to the expected loss, right? As we just had in the previous slide. Now, F star M cannot be as good as F star because F star is optimal. That is the one which minimizes the empirical loss. So from that fact, we know that this must be bigger than expected loss of F star. On the other hand, we know by the same law of large number, by the same uniform law of large numbers and the fact that F star is an H, that expected loss of F star is approximately equal empirical loss to F star, okay? So this is what we have. So we have that empirical loss of F star is approximately equal, is greater or equal than empirical um, loss of F star. Uh, I'm sorry, empirical loss of F star ARM is approximately, is greater or, or equal than uh, empirical loss of F star. On the other hand, I can go in the other direction as well. And what the other direction tells me? Well, we know that F star ARM is the one which minimizes the empirical loss. So the empirical loss of F star must be bigger than the empirical loss of F star ARM. So putting these two things together, I see that they must be approximately equal. Because I have two inequalities going in different directions. So in that case, they must be equal. Now, uh, notice that this is not quite precise because I have this approximately equal signs. Uh, and what is approximately equal? Approximately equal, basically there is a term which is of the order of C of n. 
for the classical analysis of R. So that's what approximately equal means up to the star. Now, if I don't assume that F star is at H, I would need to add some extra approximator in H. So, so imagine you can kind of, oops, sorry. you can kind of imagine this is H, this is F star, and this is F star ERM. So I would need to find something in H, which would approximate F star, and then I prove that this distance is small and that distance is small, and then by the triangle inequality, I can complete this argument. So that's basically how classical analysis of optic works. In the, in um, the, I, I have in a question. Way. Yes, please go. Um, so first of all, I'm just wanting to understand what does the SRM mean on the top of the slide, just for my own edification? Um, so what Vaptic called this, he called this structure. So there are two parts. There is empirical risk minimization, which just refers specifically to reducing empirical risk. So to, to, uh, where is this? to minimizing mm -hmm. this, right? Because this minimizes empirical risk. Uh, and the structure risk is to say that we have to have functions, which is somehow approximate the goal, the the the, the true goal. Okay. To find the abstract. So, okay. Um, and for in terms of like, and because the uniform law of large numbers has like a set definition of like, oh, this is the definition of what's going on, or like there's like a s statement for capacity control is the is the statement more or less that like H is big enough? Is that, that that's what you're trying to say that it kind of boils down to? H is like large enough to be able to- uh, It's it not necessarily, it's really the statement. It's just that there is a function in H which is close enough to F star. We're close enough being, you know, some measure of the functional distance. Um, the thing is, but you are right that usually what we say is that, okay, H is big enough, so it's close enough to, you know, every reasonable. So we, the idea would be for Waptic uh, is to grow this H as you get more and more data. And if you grow this H, you're guaranteed that eventually you'll get close to essentially arbitrary function within some much larger functional class, like smooth function. Okay, but in this regime, we're still assuming that the number of data points is much, much greater than the possible number of parameters that H can like have. Like this is in the regime, or uh, is this in the regime where like the number of, um, I guess like complexity of, of like H sort of is at the same level as the number of data points or like less, more? Yeah, so it's so very good. So complexity of H, so, so if you just take the simplest version of this, the simplest version would be just to take H to be a finite set. And then the C is log of H, or log of the cardinality of H. So essentially that is the kind of regime you want N to be significantly larger than the log of the number of, of functions in H. Um, for this to make sense, because otherwise this approximate equalities don't make sense. They're, they're not somehow, they're meaningless. Oh, okay, and in, in that case, like the C is basically um, like some, like the VC dimension or some like other thing that you- have Yeah, so it's a it's VC that. dimension, but you, you know, thinking about it as a finite set and just thinking about it as log doesn't really lose very much conception. Although of course we don't get the same. Uh, and there, there are many ways to measure complexity. I don't want to go there. Covering numbers, there is uh, Rademacher. There is like lots and lots of different ways to think about it. Uh, okay, so next. So, so this is kind of the putting this together. You, you get the, the, this is now uh, exact form of this. And this is saying that expected risk, and um, I, I like this terminology with week because what you see is what you get. I think it's very accurate. And it says that uh, this is a sort of classical optic time bound. Uh, you have expected risk, which is what you get in the future. And it's bounded by the empirical risk plus some term. 
And this term is of the order of square root of C over N, and we already discussed that uh, the C some sort of C dimension or log of the number of functions in the class. Uh, basically, as you can see, this sort of makes sense when C is significantly smaller than F. Okay, so that, that's the kind of bound that we, we're dealing with in this classical analysis. And um, so the way Lovatnik was, and this is here, here is a structural kind of end empirical um, part coming together. This is from his book. Uh, he said, okay, let's expand the number of functions. So let's expand this function class slowly. And as you expand, expanding this function class, the empirical risk goes down just the way we had it before. Uh, but now, instead of um, having this bias invariant, you have this uh, confidence interval, which is essentially the bound that we have. So you have the bound, the square root of C of A, that's the confidence interval for him. And we have the empirical risk, and this, the expected risk is bounded by the sum of those two things. So it stands to reason that you should stop this process of expansion, of expansion of the function class, when these two are of the same order. So that, that was kind of his procedure. You balance those two parts of the bound. You balance essentially empirical risk and the complexity term, the square root of C over N. And if you put them together, you get this U-shaped curve again. So that's a justification. Uh, okay, so that, that's how it works. Now, uh, of course, as we discussed before, as I already mentioned before, there is um, kind of an issue here. And this issue is already apparent once you start looking at this bound a little bit more carefully. And the issue is that you are proving this uniform law of large numbers for every function in the class. But most of these functions are totally useless, right? You got to think about it. Suppose you're doing linear regression. You're saying, I'm going to prove something for every linear function, this uniform law of large numbers. I mean, maybe I can't, but I know that most of this are not going to be useful in predictions at all. So shouldn't you only concentrate on a class which is actually close to what you expect to find. So you should have some sort of prior or some sort of idea of what you're looking for. And that's a class you really care about. If you don't care whether some random, um, if, you, if you choose just a linear predicted random with random coefficients, it's going to do terribly on the training set and it's going to be equally terrible on the test set. So yeah, it has perfect, match between train and test, but it's completely useless. And that was the idea of this margin and other posteriori bounds that you can introduce some dependence on the data. And in particular for margin bounds, if you think that your data may be linearly, suppose you think that the data are linearly separable or close to being linearly separable, um, or maybe separable with some nonlinear boundary, right? You should only look at the class of functions which have small loss because you know that's where you're looking at. And this, of course, the loss is data dependent. So that, that was a very um, insightful idea which really expanded the power of the bound. Still, as it turns out, that was not quite enough and that's what we'll discuss uh, next. Okay, any questions about this? I think maybe this is a short stop. So th this was a summary of essentially Vapnik's theory and the, the very, very brief discussion of why we may want to have some data dependent bounds. But notice that data dependent bounds still have the same form. This is still a busy week, right? What you see, which is the, this term, is essentially what you get, which is the term on the left. All right.
So if there are no questions, and please uh, do feel free to ask questions. Uh, it's better if you do it, um, you, you know, by voice, since I may not look at chat. Um, uh, Professor, can, can I ask a quick clarifying question? Mm -hmm. So th that bound, if you just use uniform law, law of large numbers would be two-sided, right? But I guess the, you don't care about the other side because like if the error is smaller. Uh, well, because you, you see the loss, um, the empirical, you, you expect this. So, so really it's two-sided. You expect that the empirical loss is always smaller than the expected loss. Got it. Because you, you, are, you are trading it on the data, right? What, imagine that the capacity of the function is infinite, right? That I can fit any trading data. That doesn't mean that I will generalize. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 so yeah, so I, I should, I, I, I think this is confusing and I should have written it as a two sided. So. Well, can I ask another question? Um, so, in the, in the, the big O notation here, this X, is it a random variable that generates um, data points or is a collection of uh, training data points like X size? Um, so in this X here is actually the set of data. So it's a set of training data, like uh, N yes. training data points. So you, you, you are allowed to take a look at the set of training data. You kind of cheat. You take a look at the set of trading data. Well, of course, it's not cheating, it's exact. But um, and then you're basically only looking at functions which, for example, achieve small empirical loss on that particular day, I see. rather and than all functions. You know, in your class, I say all linear functions. I see. So that would be a subset of linear. So imagine like all linear functions versus linear functions with a small loss on some specific. And also, uh, also labels, right? So this uh, also includes YIs. Mm. Uh, right. So this this is a good point. So yeah, X is the full data set. Yeah. So Thanks. It's not just X's, right? Thanks. Full data. One other quick question. Um, so this whole uh, framework basically uh, looks at choosing the, the, the empirical risk minimizer, um, minimizer basically randomly from the set of all existing uh, minimizers, right? There's no algorithm there yet. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say randomly, but yes, there is no algorithm. You just assume that you can choose it. And in practice, it can be very difficult, right? Try, try minimizing binary loss, you, you know, zero, one loss. You, you kind of do it. So, so optics analysis doesn't deal with the optimization issue of the issue of how to actually choose. Okay. Uh, of course, the optimization issue is a key issue in what we'll discuss. So that's another thing which is missing from the analysis. But that's um, perhaps in a sense a secondary conceptual issue. Okay. So now, um, so that that was the issue. So that was the, the setup. And now let me discuss what the issue is. And here I, you know, finally we get to interpolation. And um, interpolation is simply fitting the data exactly. Um, there are two slightly different ways to define it. Right now I'll just stick f of xi equals to yi. You could also say that the interpolation if the loss is zero. So for the square loss, Fitting data exactly at the time and having loss zero is the same thing. But if you take some other loss, maybe they're not necessarily the same. But for, for now, let's just think about fitting the data exactly. It's a very clean way to define this. Okay. So we say that F interpolates if for any data point, F of XI is exactly equal to Y. Notice, by the way, that not every data can be interpolated because, for example, if you have the same data point with different y's, right, you cannot interpolate. But um, sort of, if you think of data being chosen at random from some continuous distribution, right, the probability of having exactly the same x is zero. So not something you'll worry about. 
And uh, so let, let's think about now about um, the implications of this. Uh, so suppose you have a function which interpolates, and then um, this most bound, this straight bound is, um, has an interesting form, right? So the training loss is equal to zero. And the test loss, well, it may or may not be zero. But if it is not zero, it's kind of hard to see how this bound comes together because if 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 both training and test loss are zero, then that's great, right? If my data are clearly separate. But if it's not, it seems that this is kind of doesn't work, and uh, I will discuss this in more also detail. And it says it sort of implies that this type of bound um, that interpolation should not generalize. And this has been the, um, so don't, don't, don't take this right now very, very seriously because I'll be much more precise about this in a minute. But um, this is kind of the implication is that fitting the data exactly is usually bad unless you know the data are already separable. In that case, it's fine. And this bounds work actually if my data is separable, right? Because this is zero. This is also zero. And it's okay, zero is less or equal than zero plus some sort of term, which is hopefully small. So that's okay. Okay, in any case, so the sort of belief in statistics in the machine learning has been that um, interpolation overfits and um, it's a bad idea to fit data exactly. And so this is from uh, one yellow book. Uh, this is actually kind of an interesting picture because they basically say that the graph on the left seems to be more reasonable. Notice, by the way, it's a little bit of a, more than a little bit of hedging here, right? Seems to be more reasonable. Uh, what, what is reasonable? Um, but in any case, they don't, they don't think it's good to fit the data exactly. And it's better to have something like what they have on the right. And the, another yellow book um, also has essentially the same um, point that model with zero training error will generalize poorly. Um, well, now I think we're getting to the actual crux of the matter and why there have been an issue with understanding deep learning. And um, I think this paper made it uh, particularly clear, uh, a well-known paper from understanding deep, um, understanding deep learning requires rethinking generalization. They did the following experiment. Well, they did a number of experiments, but this was uh, one of them. They train the deep neural network on CIFAR-10, which is a image data set with 10 classes. They get train accuracy of 100%. And you, know, you would think it's overfitting, although notice that this is not the same loss function, right? It, I don't know that it actually fits the data exactly. I just know that the accuracy is 100%. Now you can ask how, how does accuracy and actual like fit is measured, for example, in L2 and square loss, how do they relate? But, uh, but essentially you would expect this to be overfit, but it doesn't seem to be overfit. They get very good accuracy on the test set, almost 90%. So you can fit the data exactly, yet you're essentially paying nothing for it in terms of overfit. So that was, um, an important point, which was made fairly recently, of course, it goes back again, the same observations go back way before that. And in fact, for this margin based bound that I just mentioned, uh, they were introduced at this paper uh, by Shapir, Freund, Bartlett, and Lee. And the whole premise of the paper, they were trying to explain the following phenomenon the test error in boosting does not increase even if the size of the model becomes large, which is exactly the same kind of phenomenon that you see with this neural network, right? The very large neural network fits the data exactly and yet doesn't seem to overfit. 
the same happened with boosting. And I remember that around that time, or maybe slightly later, early 2000s, there was this um, idea that somehow boosting does not work. So let me now be a little bit more precise because this is suggestive, but it does not directly invalidate VZWIG bounds. And in fact, the margin bounds are VZWIG. So let, let's see how to set up experiments which will completely um, contradict this. I, I don't want to say contradict, but show that this bounds really don't apply. And the question is, well, how do you test model complexity? And the simplest thing to do this is actually, you know, for real data, you don't usually know what it is, but you actually have a very nice kind of um, knob that you can turn, which is simply adding some noise to the data. And what do I mean by adding noise? Well, you take this data and imagine this data linearly separable, just to make it simple, and you randomize some of the labels. So you take some percentage of the data, say 20%, and you assign random labels to it. And you get something like what you have on the right. Now you see if you want to fit the data, the first observation is that the actual optimal classifier doesn't change from randomizing the data and, uh, you know, uh, base optimal classifier does not change and you can take it as an exercise to prove it, it's not hard. So uh, optimal. So the optimal predictor in this randomized, so, so I'm assuming that I'm choosing data at random uniformly, and then I'm flipping the labels at random. Uh, so the optimal predictor actually stays the same. So it was linearly separable before, it would be linearly separable here as well. But if you want to fit the data exactly, you immediately see that your model must become extremely complex. Something like this, right? This is the this will be your model which predicts the data correctly. So if fitting noisy data were a problem, we would should see that adding any label noise leads to quick deterioration of the results. And let's see whether this actually happens. And oh, and I should point out, let's let, let just think about the optimal predictor. How well can optimal predictor do? So imagine that, uh, so let, let me just draw this graph here. So this is level of noise here. And by level of noise, I mean how, what percentage of the data are randomized. So if I start with, so it's 0%, so, and this is loss. So it's 0%, right? In this case, I should get the loss to be zero because the data are linearly separable. Now, if I randomize all of my data 100%, then uh, what should I get? I should get 50% because, right? Because that's a random guess. So I should get 0.5 here at 100%. So this is a very ugly picture. Right. So if my data are completely random, then any predictor would be expected to do 50% of the time correctly just by accident. And if my data are exactly linearly separable, then the optimal predictor would give loss zero. And you can actually check, and again, this is a simple exercise, that there is a that there is a linear dependence here on the level of noise. And yeah, there is a question, Kartik. Um, sir, I'm, I'm trying to like understand exactly what you mean by the base optimal predictor here. Is it like, are you assuming that the distribution is somewhat uniform over that? Oh yeah, so, so base space? optimal, I, I'm sorry, I introduced this without explaining what it is. Base optimal is simply F star. 
but F star for minimizing the expected classification. So it's a prediction with zero, the smallest classification loss, expected classification loss. But in the second case, the it would depend on, like that I am assuming is a sample from the data distribution, right? We, we don't know what the actual data distribution looks like. Mm -hmm. So it could be that the base optimal maybe is still a zero loss predictor also there, right? Uh, no, no. So here is a claim. So suppose I have a distribution, okay? And this distribu arbitrary distribution, it has this base optimal predictor, the ones which minimizes classification loss. Now my claim is that consider now a distribution with the following property that it's the same distribution as, above, as below, as, as, as before, with probability say 50%, and with probability 50%, instead of taking the same label as before, I just take a random label. It's a new probability distribution, which you just toss a coin. If this coin comes out heads, you randomize the label. Awesome. That's yeah, what that I mean sense. by adding noise. So the first claim is that the predictor, the optimal predictor is actually the same for first distribution and the second distribution, independently of the level of noise. It's kind of remarkable, but it's simple to try. You, you can just figure out, uh, I'll leave it as an exercise how to do Yeah, it. thanks. Um, so second thing is that I actually can predict exactly how much, but my, my, so the prediction is the same, but of course I'm doing worse because I cannot predict data which are noisy. So I'm giving up on predicting on certain percentage of the data essentially those which are corrupted by noise. Well, how much do I give up? Well, if all of my data are noisy, I give up all of it, so I'm a chance. If none of my data are noisy, I'm giving up nothing. So if my initial distribution was perfectly separable, then I, it would be the same, right? So assuming my initial distribution has zero loss, and I don't need to assume it, I'm just making it to simplify it, look more at this picture. Uh, I have this line, and this is a straight line, connecting zero to 0.5. So at zero, I have zero and at 100%, I have 0.5, okay? If I have more than two classes, say I have 10 classes, instead of 0.5 here, I would have 0.9 because I would have, the loss would be 90%, right? Because only one tenth probability of choosing the class of random. So that's, that's basically would be the best predictor, okay? So the best predictor would have this dependence on the noise level. But what, what, why is this an interesting uh, setup? It's because we expect that fitting the data exactly should really, everything should break, right? If you think that there was some nice line here, and if we think that interpolation is bad, when we add even a little bit of noise, we should get way, way worse results because we're overfitting. And this is the test. We are seeing whether this actually happened. And the result is, um, this is what you actually get with, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll actually, I'll explain in a minute what kind of method I'm using here. But um, the, the green line, this is a 10 class, this is MNIST actually. So this is a 10 class predictor. The green line, is the best possible. And what do I mean by the best possible? I'm assuming that my data are separable, which is not necessarily quite true, but it's close to true. It's, um, it's a simple data set. You could get very low error on this, but you certainly cannot be better than, cannot do better than zero. So not, no predictor can do better than this green line. And so at zero, I have zero, and at 100% noise level, I have 0 0.9, 90%. So this is um, the best possible thing that you can get. Now, uh, you would expect that fitting the data exactly would give you bad results. And Let's see what actually happens. And let's look specifically at the Laplace curl, which is this red line. 
And actually, this gives me a good opportunity to explain what kernel machines are, because that's um, that's um, um, they will become useful later. And uh, the kernel machine in this case is a Laplace kernel machine is the following. So Laplace kernel is simply this. It's a function of two variables. I mean, Z, divided by something, but it really doesn't matter. So the kernel machine is simply a function with the following property. It's just f of x is equal to sum alpha i e x minus x i. OK? This is a kernel machine. So it's simply a thumb of the things, um, of this um, functions. And what is the sum over? It's over the training points. So xi's are my training data. So xi, yi, the training data. And now how do I train it? I train it so that f of xi is equal to yi. OK, this is my training. All. And if you think about what this means, if you actually write it down, you realize that this is a very uh, this is a very um, uh, very simple thing. You simply invert a matrix. So this alpha i. So th this alpha i is a vector is equal to k minus one times the vector of y's, y1 dot 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 y n, where k is the following matrix. It's i minus xj. Okay. So that's a mathematical way to write this problem of training. So why do I like it? Well, one reason is just because in start of training some complicated neural network, I simply can write down this matrix and it's not too large. So you can put it in a computer and you simply invert it and that's it. So it makes this whole um, somewhat mysterious problem of training reduced to a mathematical object that we understand a lot better. Matrix manipulation. In any case, We'll discuss more of these kernel machines later because they really produce a lot of, uh, of um, important uh, insight, I feel. In any case, if you look at this red line, which I'm just uh, marking this, um, you can see that it tracks the green line very, very closely. How do I undo this? Let me see if I can. Ah, OK. Uh, now, I can use a Gaussian kernel and I can use a neural network and I get some but similar results, slightly worse, but also they kind of track it nicely. So this is what I have. Oh, okay, this is a much nicer uh, picture. So you see, fitting noisy data doesn't lead to significant overfitting at all. And um, I should point out that when you do matrix inversion, you feed the noisy data in the most clean possible sense because you're really feeding it exactly point by point and the precision is very high. It's like 10 to the minus 25, something like that. Machine precision uh, And I see that uh, Aurea raised hand. Yes, thank you, Professor. How would you expect overfitting to look like in this graph? Because when I see it, it's not immediately clear to me that the purple line is not overfitting. Because I see huge test error. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, but um, OK. So when you say overfitting, you have to look at the difference between the green line and that line, right? Because you cannot do better than the green line. The, so overfitting is not, you may think it's this, but no, it's actually the difference between the green line. The green line is theoretically best. Uh, 
Now, uh, how do I see that? What would I expect? Well, if you sort of believe this classical story, right? Once you have that fitting noisy data, you should go very quickly something like this. It should just take off. But even fitting a little bit of noisy data should be bad. Fitting a lot of noisy data, so think about this. This is 70% at this point of my data actually have random label. So I'm fitting tremendous, tremendous number of noise. noise. And even there, well, you could say maybe purple light overfit. I would say that even that purple light doesn't overfit too much. But certainly the red light overfit remarkably little, maybe like 5% or something, something like that. So. Thank you, Professor. Um, so I had a question as well. Um, so these kernel methods uh, seem very similar to like expressing a function using a bunch of basis functions, like for example, expanding it in a Fourier series and figuring out the coefficients of the basis functions of cos and sine. So, and you said that you're summing over these uh, individual piecewise functions, which depend on the number of points you have. So if you increase the number of points, wouldn't you be more likely to overfit? Um, yeah, so you can change the number of points. It doesn't change the, the nature of this graph. This, this graph, you essentially get the same thing for the number of points. Um, they, they are actually there. There is another way for this kernel method um, called radial basis functions. Which is essentially that it is right. You you put a, you put like a kind of a basis function at every data point, and then you fit so, it. I'll discuss the connection to reproducing kernel Hilbert space because the way I described it is kind of very naive. There is a much um, more um, principled way of looking at this, rather than just saying okay, it's just a sum of the things. But if you just want to implement it, the sum is fine. You just that's what you. You invert the matrix. Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. and I think I'm uh, riding out of time, but let me, okay, uh, let me, uh, I'll, um, le let me sort of finish with the issue here. And the issue is the following. So if, as we already said, it doesn't seem to overfit, or at least it doesn't overfit very much. It may maybe overfit a tiny little bit. But you, you know, it would be unreasonable to expect it to do as well as the possible theoret best possible theoretical predictor, right? It's even even for like very good predictors, it's too much to ask. But think about the the, the bound, right? Because you remember the empirical part of the bound is equal to zero. So that means that if you want to have some sort of non-trivial bound, this capacity term has to account for the predictor. For, for the prediction. And if you look at this high level of noise, you see it's between 0.7 and 0.9. So if my capacity term is bigger than 0.9, it is totally useless because 0.9 is a random prediction. So I can say it's less than 10, but it's totally useless. If it's smaller than 0.7, it cannot be correct because 0.7 is the best predictor. So you have this extremely narrow range where this bound could hopefully account for generalization. And the problem is, is that it just doesn't seem possible at all. First, the constant needs to be exact. And I'm not even saying that there are usually log terms and there are other things in this bound. So how, you know, there are just no bounds with that type of precision. And second, um, how would the quantity C of n even know that you randomize some of this data, right? It somehow, it can be data dependent, so maybe you can say it depends on x. But then even then, like how do you tell from data how much noise you have, right? This is, it seems impossible. And I should point out that recently there were uh, several works showing that uh, really like in some settings, no bound of this form really exists. So you, you can prove it theoretically. Uh, so that's, uh, that's maybe, um, it's, 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 I think a good point to stop. This is, I think, um, the nature of the crisis is this in generalization in deep learning. It actually is, is the fact that the bounds 
and sort of analysis that we had don't seem to account for the empirical observation as actually observed much earlier, but it really brought to the surface by the success of deep learning. Because as we will see, deep learning seems to really exist in this regime, which is maybe not exactly interpolation, but something closer to interpolation than to this classical bound, uh, you know, balance bounds regime that Lovely uh, proposed. So I'll stop here. And um, yeah, if, if there are any questions, I'm uh, very happy to. Uh, Can I have a quick question now? So b before you do that, Gadi, let's just yeah. thank Misha. And yeah. let, me, let me just say overall, the next lecture starts in about, okay, let's see, 22 minutes. I'll post the link to the gather town if people want to go there. But assuming Misha's fine with it, I think it'd be great you know, to field questions. There appear to be lots of uh, follow-ups. So thanks a lot, Misha. Uh, thanks, Boris. So thanks a lot. And um, uh, Boris, is it okay if I stay here and answer questions or? The yeah, I mean, that, that's great. You know, in some sense, it's better because this will be recorded so people can benefit from the answers to the questions as well. Great. Great. So, so yeah, thank you very much. It was very um, enlightening. Um, so one question uh, that I, uh, that bothered me is, is there, what is, what is special about kernel methods that, um, or is there something special about kernel methods that make them uh, behave this oh. way? Mm -hmm. Or, and do other algorithms be, have, we know that, you know, neural networks may, uh, you know, kind of have the same uh, trend, but maybe, I don't know, random forests or other uh, algorithms maybe also have um, similar behavior and, and do they have something in common? Ah, yeah, so this is, this is a really, I think, uh, to, to the point. Uh, the, there is nothing special about kernel method, but there are some advantages to kernel methods. Over, and um, the reason I show that this purple curve is actually a neural network. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why did I choose kernel? Why did we choose kernel methods? And why, why is what's the advantage of this? First, the optimization process is just matrix inversion. So you don't have any random initialization choosing all. So, so a lot of the mystery of neural network is completely removed from here. Um, that's the first thing. Second thing, and I'll discuss this more, is that kernel methods, we kind of understand, we thought we understood the theory of kernel methods quite well. Now, uh, it turns out that we didn't understand it quite as well as we thought. But still, it relates to this functional spaces, um, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, Sobolev spaces, all this mathematics, which we um, sort of have much better grasp on than deep neural networks. So it allows us to make a connection by showing that this is not specific to deep network and not particular magic of deep network. It allows us to connect to things which we can at least hope to understand mathematically. And I think we understand it now. Uh, and then you, I think Andrea will talk about some of this. But then you know, but then you kind of, like you said, you brought to the surface the fact that uh, actually there are some parts of kernel um, methods that are not well understood maybe. Yeah, so that was a kind of an interesting thing is that um, it looks like um, if you look at most classical analysis of uh, kernel machines, they always use this regularization term mm -hmm. and they also do this balancing procedure similar to kind of optics uh, balancing of bounds. And, now we realize that it's really not necessary. It, at least in practice, it's very clear. You don't have to do it. You still get okay results. Maybe you get slightly better by doing all this balancing, but it's very marginal. So uh, practice shows that it's not necessary. Theory, we're now starting to have some theory. It's not complete. But sort of, I think this classical thinking that we have to regularize and not fit the noisy data kind of confused us in terms of theoretical understanding of these issues as well. It's, uh, yeah, so that's, yeah. Thank you. I have a, a couple of questions, if it's, it's okay. Um, first of all, in this chart that you're showing on the screen now, did you find other methods that performed poorly in the, in the way that you'd expect with this red line that you drew? 
um, perform poorly. We have not really looked for that very much. I mean, the sort of goal was to show that methods perform well. So I presume that some, well, you can kind of see that a Gaussian kernel, for example, is significantly worse than the Laplace kernel. There is some reason. Would something like like a low number of nearest neighbors or something do particularly badly there? I don't know, I'm just trying to figure out what the difference with like qualitatively between these algorithms that are not overfitting and ones that in the past led everyone to think that in this situation you'd overfit. Well, I'll discuss this. So yeah, um, you, if you take something like a linear model with the number of parameters, which is almost equal to the number of data points, that will, that will do badly. So there are regimes in which you get clear overfitting. I'll talk about this later on. Basically, but this not kernel machine so much and not, you can get it with neural networks. So imagine that my neural network is not too large and not too small. I can kind of get the same regime. So very large neural network will perform similar to kernels, but there is some regime when it's kind of smallish, but not really small when you get similar. The problem is neural network, it's kind of tricky because, um, oh yeah, that's another thing I should point out why kernels are so nice. I can fit my data exactly, right? Because it's just matrix inversion. With neural network, good luck fitting the data exactly. Well, you run your SGD or whatever, Adam, I don't know. And you get something, but how do you know whether you're close? You get like 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four, is it good enough? Well, who knows, right? With, with kernels, there is no question you get very close to pure interpolation. Okay, yeah, I see there are several uh, people raised hand, but I don't know who, so. Uh, hi, Professor Bilkin, I had a question. So a couple of slides back, you introduced boosting, some results on boosting. So, uh, so is it fair to say that boosting helps you to reduce overfitting when the size of hypothesis space increases? Um, I don't know that boosting really overfits as such even. I, um, it's kind of interesting actually, because when I first heard it, I, I was a graduate student when I first heard that boosting doesn't overfit, I was somehow very skeptical at that point. That now I, uh, uh, can, I believe it is kind of true, close to being true in any case. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think it really overfits. It, um, the thing is, when you run boosting, you somehow make it more and more complex as you run along, right? It's it's kind of it's it's similar to doing gradient descent, the stochastic gradient. Actually, there are interpretations of boosting which are in terms of something like coordinate descent. So what happens is that uh, as you go along, you make the predictor more and more complex, and usually that helps performance. And usually, well, doesn't always help performance, but it doesn't usually. Um, detract from performance. So it, it doesn't it doesn't overfit that. By running it longer, you don't make it worse. Typically. And that's what we see with uh, like this kernel machines. You can train them by gradient descent. And you see you can you can do early stopping or you can you don't have to do early stopping. The results are about the same. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I see there are some. Uh, Ch Chandlin? Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, could you comment on the relationship between this um, experiment and the uh, representer theorem of kernels? Because here um, you're using the, this direct inversion to, mm -hmm. to interpolate the data, right? And I, I think for representer theorem, at least the versions that I see, uh, typically people require a, re a regularization term. Um, with this term, I mean, you couldn't just uh, do a direct inversion, right? Um, yeah, so the way it's, so, so actually the, what I wrote is representer, is a specific form of the representer theory. Uh, it, it's kind of neat because you can write representer theory without talking about like- I see. So there's a version of representer theorem without the regularizer. Um, uh, so uh, so it's, uh, if you want to think about the, of this version as a regularizer, you can. It's a minimum norm solution. So it's like adding a regularizer, which is infinitely small. I see. Infinitesimal I see. regularizer, it's equivalent. Thank you. Uh -huh.
questions? I have uh, a question. Uh -huh. um, over here, how does this depend on the bandwidth of the kernel? Is this uh, particularly tuned? And I think maybe we would be interested in how the performance of the entire class of estimators uh, comes out to be, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great uh, point. So, so the I I think it was I forget exactly how that was tuned. I think it was tuned on uh, cross validated on clean data. It wasn't specifically tuned for noisy data. Um, the interesting thing here, and actually that's something if you know if you use it in practice, I would recommend. Um, actually, that's a reason. I one reason I recommend Laplace. I used to use. Gaussian kernel, and now I just think Laplace kernel is better. One reason is Laplace kernel, at least empirically, appears to be very robust to tuning of the sigma parameter. A Gaussian kernel, you really have to choose it right. So if you are to use it in practice, I would say Gaussian kernel sometimes is better, but actually for noisy data, Laplace kernel is better. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, it's um, very robust to tuning makes it nice to use. Uh, it would be interesting, I think, I don't think we have full understanding of the dependence on the sigma parameter. I, I mean, I can comment on this. Like Gaussian kernel, actually, you can, actually, Gaussian kernel is kind of neat, is that uh, you can show that um, when sigma is very small, it's essentially one nearest neighbor. When sigma is very large for data which are spherical, it actually becomes a linear classifier. So somehow choosing the sigma interpolate well, in the different sense interpolates mm -hmm. between linear and one nearest neighbor. Which I, think, you know. I see. Um, just uh, one part which was not clear. So uh, I'm one like if you choose the bandwidth parameter on the clean data, isn't it in some sense unfair because you, you're using some information that uh, that should not be used by the estimator, right? Um, if you like, use the bandwidth and clean data, I don't know. It's hard to say what's fair, what's unfair. You, you know, you, 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 I think it would be unfair to tune it for every level of those separately, right? Because you could argue that. I think as long as it's tuned the same way for everything, it's okay. So. I see. And just one last question. So in the next slide, you say that uh, you can also have data, dis like you say that even for data distribution based complexity measures, the YCY bounds don't work. But again, that I feel there is an underlying assumption that there is no complexity term based on, let's say, properties of the model that could give rise to such, that could explain it, right? Yeah, so this is actually a really uh, kind of interesting philosophical point. What do you mean by the C of N X, right? What is the C of N is? So you can imagine that you could, in principle, imagine that I'm allowed to look at my my, my, my data and I cross validate. So C of C does something like cross validate my predictor of the data, right? That does some crazy stuff. In which case, you can't get a bound like that because it's essentially you're kind of looking at part of the data, right? Just split your data into validation set and this and then look at the validation set. So you, you could somehow cheat. I would think that it's not kind of useful as a measure of complexity. So what's the point of the bound which already incorporates, if this C incorporates everything that you know about the data. Uh, but but I mean- uh, It's kind just, of useless in a sense. But I mean, just restricting to the training data, maybe let's say the function learned has a, a very high Lipschitz norm or some Hessian measure is large, then you could still argue, right? No, it's not something so simple. Uh, because My, you see, yeah. if you if you still have the same problem, it, if it's just a norm, it would have the same issue. Because first, is there no constant there, right? If you have a constant, it has to be accurate within 0.5 or within a factor of two. That's one thing. The second thing, how would it know about the base risk and so on? Yeah, I, I think that 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 has the same issue. You can really only get away if you do some sort of like seriously tweaking kind of. Thank and you. Then, okay, it is an interesting philosophical question of when when is a day when it is day when is this kind of bound useful? Uh, so yeah, okay, but I should yeah, any there were more questions I saw.
A quick question is just about the notation about the Laplace kernel. It does matter the, the norm of the Laplace kernel or what is the norm L2 L, or LP? Oh, well, Laplace kernel is just this. It's e to the minus. So it's, um, in, uh, I didn't really find this carefully, but it's a function of two variables, which just has this form. This is a definition. So it's very similar to the Gaussian, except that there is no square. Yeah, but, but the norm is an L2 norm? Oh yeah, the norm. Yeah, this is L2 norm. Okay. Um, this is a confusing point because sometimes people use a one norm and they also call it a plus curve. That's not the term. It's a red L curve. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, there are. Um, it's a, there is this family of kernels actually, which um, e to the minus x minus z to some power. Alpha by, by sigma. So for two, it will be Gaussian. For one, that will be Laplace. And they're a fractional power. What's interesting, it looks like for noisy data, this more picked one works better, even, even more picked than Laplace, like one half. At least in practice, that seems to be the case. Um, can I just ask a follow up about the previous question I was asked in terms of the bounds, of, like the negative result on the bounds? Is there any hope for like localized measures of complexity? So there's like localized Radomacher complexity where you just measure the complexity around the optimal function in the class. Would that get around the problem of not being able to see the base classifier somehow? I mean, I know the base classifier might not be in the class either, but you can actually have like inequalities that work for like Oracle inequalities that still give you um, some kind of bounds or is there no hope at all for this kind of bound? I don't think there is a lot of hope because as long as you have VZ weak, right? Somehow, I mean, the problem that the constants have to be exact is still there, even if you somehow, I mean, it would take some magic to somehow get rid of the fact that you don't know the base optimal, but even then, like how do you, there is just no bounds with exact constants. So, it would be too magical. I mean, I mean, I don't think that there is. So, so there are some results. I, I mentioned two results which prove that in some settings there are bounds don't exist. But you, you may say, okay, maybe in some other setting they do. But it's too magical to have something like that. It's just too much to expect. Okay, thank you. That's fine. You know, I understand. Yeah, another question. And may maybe after this, we should stop because the next, uh, so maybe I'll take the last question. Uh, Andreas, I think, uh, colloquial, uh, uh, Andreas lecture is coming up. Huh? Last question? Is it mine? I suppose it is. Um, Go for it. Is whether we get this no overfitting phenomenon, yes or no, uh, is it determined by, I guess, the distribution of the data, right? Maybe the variance or the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. Uh, it's just like a shot in the dark, I'm guessing here. Is there, what determines whether we get this phenomenon, yes or no, I suppose is the question. It's a really hard question. I don't have a, so in some cases like for linear regression, there've been analysis uh, showing that it relates to certain properties of the covariance matrix, for example, something about eigenvalue decay. I'll talk about some other way to view it in terms of, um, you can kind of create this nearest neighbor schemes, which have this non overfitting, benign overfitting, you know, this type of uh, phenomena. Um, uh, but I don't know what in general. So maybe the last comment is that it seems very general because we see this very consistently with a lot of different architectures and a lot of different methods. So there must be something more general than what we have. But our analysis are either for specific methods, like you know, nearest neighbor or linear regression, or requiring some much more kind of specialized condition for both. So I think, I mean, this is, I guess, at the, at the bottom of this question of generalization. I don't think we have full understanding, but I will, I will go with specific examples. And um, thanks everyone. I should 
finish now to let Andreas start his lecture. And uh, yeah, see everybody on Thursday. Thanks again, Misha. Hello. And we'll just give everyone a minute or two to uh, Andrew. back to the appointed Hi, hour. Andrea. Nice living room. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, I had to spend the pandemic somewhere pleasant, right? <laughs> Stanford open now, Andrea? Um, faculty and things? Mostly, mostly. So, yeah, it's sort of similar here. But I mean, we'll see what happens with the Delta variant. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> supposed to be normally full but there's no right but but officially all the students the undergrads are invited back and the grad students in a room for the coming yeah that's what i understand it feels good to be able to come to office <laughs> definitely <laughs> I mean, before I would have said, I don't need to go to the office, I can go to a coffee shop, but you know, <laughs> not so simple, it turns out. Okay, let's slowly get started and I assume people will trickle in. So welcome back everybody for our second first lecture, so to speak. Um, so it's really a great pleasure to have Andrea Montanari here to, to give us a course. Let me just say a few words by way of introduction. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, of course, Andrea, I didn't actually clear this with you. <laughs> so. Uh, Andrea got his PhD in 2001 in theoretical physics, um, and he's currently a professor at Stanford in electrical engineering. He has a number of impressive awards. And statistics. And statistics. Oh, sorry, in statistics or and statistics? And statistics. And statistics. Okay, thank you. Good. Doesn't I was matter. not Bayes optimal, you know. <laughs> um, so he, he's gotten a, a number of impressive awards and accolades. I'm just going to list a few of the representative ones, more or less in chronological order, I think. So he got a, a bronze medal of the CNRS in theoretical physics in 2006. He was also the recipient of the James Massey Award uh, by the Information Theory Society 2016, uh, as well as the Lacan Prize of the French Statistical Society in 2020. And he was also an invited ICM speaker in 2020. So, so it's really a great privilege to have Andrea here, but, but also more on the topic of the summer school, you know, Andrea together with some of his collaborators has done fundamental work, both on optimization and generalization for neural networks. And, you know, I assume some, some subset or superset of that will be covered in the course. So thanks very much for being here, Andrea. Great. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Let me try to share my screen. There's always a moment of not a, okay works <laughs> okay so this is uh, this is uh, the title of the talk of uh, this lecture uh, is deep learning a statistical viewpoint and uh, okay I'll be lecturing with uh, Theo Misakiewicz I don't know if he's online but we'll give him some complementary you know TA or uh, sessions mainly covering some complementary material and uh, um, 
Okay, perhaps a better title, uh, you know, less less grand title would be would have been introduction to the analysis of neural networks in the linear regime because this is what I'll do, um, and um, and so I'll focus to to very simple neural network model and focus on this extremely simple linear regime and show that despite this there is you know lots of interesting things going on there and. Uh, uh, I, I, at least in part, I think a good reference for the material that I'll cover is a review paper with, with Peter Bartlett and Sasha Racklin that is available online and that has the same title as these lectures. And uh, I'll use, I'll use uh, notability and I'll write, uh, you know, handwrite notes. So I'll, I'll post them somewhere, you know, by default on my webpage if I don't find a better way. And uh, actually, we are trying to LaTeX these notes. Um, so, you know, hopefully, we'll make them available with, with not too much delay in, in uh, typed format. Okay, so this lecture today is mainly, is mainly introductory. So, I want to give some, uh, describe some models and provide motivations. So this is what lect lecture one will be about. And then from lecture two on, I'll go uh, you know, deeper into the analysis of these models. And please you know, interrupt me at any, at any occasion. Uh, I don't have really a, you know, extremely good sense of what is your background. So, so you know, you, you'll help me a lot if, if, you, if you stop me, even you know, concerning notations or whatever. Okay, so all of these lectures will be about supervised learning. And so we have data yi, xi that are, you know, the standard model, they are n data points. These are iid with some common distribution p that is unknown. And this is a distribution on uh, you know, r times rd. So D is uh, the space of the covariance vectors uh, Xi, right? And uh, and what we want to do, we want uh, a, a model that is a function Rd to R. Oh, so the Xi are covariance vector, the Yi are labels, and you want a function to predict the new labels. Okay. And, and the way we, we qualify the, the quality of such a model is, is via test error. So what is the test error? Is, uh, okay, for a model F is R of F is the expectation of Okay, in general, so I already specialized this more generally would be the expectation of a loss function applied at where perhaps L is a loss function, but uh, okay, in this lecture, I'll focus really on, on square loss for, for simplicity, right? And uh, okay, I'll mention perhaps some, some uh, or will give references about results in, in non-square loss case. And um, okay, here the expectation is of course, with respect to the, this new data point. Okay, so expectation. that you know, the simplest possible thing, we assume that has the same distribution as the training uh, points, okay? So, so okay, typically, uh, okay, most of this, this lecture, we will be interested in parametric models. Neural networks are parametric model. This means that F of X is really, you know, with an abuse of notation f of x and theta, where theta is a vector of parameters. Okay, and so therefore r is really a function, not you know, with abuse of notation again. R first of all, r will depend on f in general. So I should have really written r 
as a function of f and of the probability low p. And really, you know, since this is parametric model in, you know, you can think of it as a function of the vector of parameters theta. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, there is one standard way. Uh, that is ERM. Instead of minimizing the, the population, you know, this is sometimes called the test error or population risk. Or population error. You minimize the empirical error or train error that is the mean over the sample. The, the average over the sample, you replace the average. Okay, I should write. Oh, sometimes you write this as to emphasize that is really the mean over the empirical. where this e hat is just the mean, is the empirical process that is the mean over the empirical. Okay, so to, to, to be done with the, with the preliminaries, uh, what we have in mind of uh, how this optimization is done, you know, in modern systems is done by first order methods. Okay, so what are first order methods? These are algorithms that use only gradient information. Okay, so they don't compute actions. And of course, the simplest example is gradient descent. Um, so you have some step size and then you move in the gradient of the empirical risk. Okay, let me, let me add a, a slight twist of it uh, on this simple algorithm. I'll, I'll put here a scaling matrix, a fixed scaling matrix, because it will be useful for me. So S is a, a P by P diagonal matrix uh, that will be fixed. It's just to say, okay, I can, I can update different variables to you know with different with different step size okay and uh, here epsilon k is the step size of course in practice people don't do this but they do sgd or or variants of sgd okay of course the simplest version of sgd is the one in which instead of updating with respect to the whole uh uh, empirical risk you update at each time you draw perhaps i k you draw a uniformly random point and then you 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 do the update just to respect to that point the risk at that point right so So here you should put the loss evaluated the yi and f at xi theta. And in the case of square loss, of course, we all know how to compute the derivatives of squares. This means two, and then there will be uh, yi minus f xi theta k. Oh. So this is at i equal i k. And then there is a plus, and then there is s times the gradient of f respect to theta x i theta. Okay, so, so you know, I will not focus too much on algorithms here. Oh, there is a, 
hand raised, please. Uh, okay, I, just a, a quick question. I, I haven't seen the like the scaling matrix being used before, and, and I, I don't see how it is. It's not equivalent to just choosing the right step size, right? Is it something like preconditioning? Um, um, uh, it's 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 like taking a different step size in different coordinates. In different coordinates. Uh, let me let me. Okay, so I don't know if to take a detour, right? I mean, okay, perhaps let's take a detour. One way of uh, you know, let's take an optimization detour. Okay, this is. Uh, it's it, it's not gonna play any role. This is why I'm, I'm hesitating. It's it's gonna play a very minor role in all of uh, the lectures, and I will not talk about optimization. But let me nevertheless take a small detour. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't have a background in optimization, okay. Uh, so what is one way of thinking uh, of optimization? You want to optimize. Say that you want to optimize. Uh, Rn of theta. Okay, and uh, and uh, uh, one way to think about it is that uh, of an algorithm is that at each step, uh, what what I'm doing is uh, I'm minimizing uh, something like this. So let me call it. Uh, um, let me call it. Uh, you optimize some model. So you optimize over theta some model, some approximate. Think of it as some approximation uh, for 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 the optimization function at theta, and this model will depend on the current iterate plus one over two epsilon, or okay, let's say one over epsilon times a distance between theta and theta uh, k. This doesn't need to be really a distance. I call it a distance. And what gradient descent? So this distance tells me what is the, the metric in which I'm, I'm doing optimization, the geometry in which I'm doing optimization, and the model tells me, okay, well, how you encode the cost function. Okay, so first order methods typically, so this is arg min, correspond to the model being first order Taylor expansion. Okay, so the model will be theta minus theta k times the gradient of r at n at theta k. And of course, I could put the zero order term, but that doesn't matter optimization. And then, uh, uh, and then you can put any distance, right? And uh, so this is an example. And you can put any distance here, and let's say that you take an L2 distance. So I don't know now if this epsilon coincides with that epsilon, but. So this is standard gradient descent. Okay, you can check that this is standard gradient descent. Um, now you can replace, the simplest modification is that you can replace this L2 distance by any other L2 distance with respect to a uh, you know, positive semi-definite matrix, S minus one. And if I put a, another a positive semi-definite matrix that is diagonal, I get this thing. Okay, so, okay. So it, it just changes the geometry in which I'm looking at. You know, the first order method are notoriously not invariant under scaling of the coordinate axis. And here I'm, I'm rescaling different coordinate axis differently, right? But again, this is gonna play only a very minor role. I, I need it for you know, a small computation at some point in this lecture. Okay, any other question? So let, let me mention another first order method that is not an algorithm really, it's, it's really a, a theoretical design, device and this is gradient flow. And uh, you can think of it as the zero step size limit of gradient descent or of SGD. So this is the epsilon to zero limit. Okay, and what, what this is, this is just, you know, uh, 
you know, if I want to put this step, so this is an ODE, so it's a flow. Uh, theta dot means derivative respect to time of theta. That, that, uh, you know, so it's a flow that is defined as solution of this ODE. And okay, you, you can imagine very easily that this is the zero step size limit of that. And you know, often it happens that you know, under reasonable condition in, in the case of gradient descent or SGD, if epsilon is, is inverse polynomial, okay, let me say epsilon small enough, then gradient descent or SGD are approximately the same as gradient flow. Mm -hmm. This is something that has to be taken with care because the converse is not only always true. It's not always true that you can take a continuous time you know, flow and then map it into an algorithm that is an actual practical algorithm. Okay. So, so let me let me make one one last remark. Okay, a remark. So this this cost that we are trying to optimize. Uh, okay, so this depends, of course, on on the parametric model f. Uh, but it, it depends on the parametric model in a very special way. It depends on it only through the evaluation of f on the n data points. Okay, so of course, as, as far as optimization is concerned, all, all that you're interested in is in this n-dimensional vector. Or better, you're interested in this map, Fn, that is a map from Rp to R. Okay, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, for instance, in the case of a square Ross, you know, the, 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 the risk that I wrote is just one over n, y minus Fn. Okay, so this is generic background about uh, optimization. Um, again, I will not focus much about optimization, but but uh, you know, to to give motivation, I need it. And the the kind of model on which I I'll focus is two layers neural networks, or one in the layer. So this is really the simplest possible model of a neural network. So I'll put a scaling here. So think of alpha as a constant. And then I'll have a capital N in neurons. And then this. So this is of course a parametric model and the parameters are a1 to A capital N, and then W1 to W capital N. So this is a set, a vector of parameters in R capital N, the number of neurons times D plus one. Okay, so P, uh, the number of parameters is D plus one. So there is a, is a question here uh, that, that I call the optimization question is a largely open question. And, uh, and is the following, how is it possible that a GD or SGD optimizes? All right. Okay. That is uh, a highly non-convex function, and in general, it has multiple minima.
Okay. Yeah, there is a question here. Um, what's little d here? Uh, d, little d is the input dimension. So. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. Yes, another question. Hi, Professor Montanari. So I have a question. Why do you need an extra alpha term outside? Why can't you push it in, inside? I, I can't, I can't. So, so this is a constant. I can push it out inside. Um, you'll, see, you'll see in a moment. It's useful to put this normalization constant and you'll see in a moment that uh, this changes a little bit some of the calculation. But yeah, as a model is exactly the same. But then if you start to doing uh, uh, yeah, some calculation, then having this scaling is convenient. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, so this is this is uh, the optimization question. You know, you have this highly you know, non-convex function that I brought here. It's this where you substitute this form of f. How, how is it possible that so I run gradient descent? A gradient descent will be approximated by gradient flow. So in some sense, will converge to the closest local minimum. How come I? I, I you know, how, how is it possible that that uh, you know this optimize in any decent way? Uh, the cost function, uh, the risk. And, and uh, okay, we don't really have an answer to, to this question. There are partial partial answer to this, but there is kind of a, a, an intuition or an emerging, uh, that uh, say an intuition that many people, um, okay, that is kind of, uh, somehow a consensus intuition. And that is, uh, you know, perhaps what's happening is that, uh, um, so I call this, this intuition uh, tractability via over parameterization. Mm -hmm. In other words, the basic principle underlying tractability in, in classical optimization is convexity. So the basic justification for something being tractable in, in, in classical optimization is convexity. And here there is a, a quite different principle that is basically found empirically is that is if you, the model is highly overparameterized, and of course, you know, one has to take in more condition, then it becomes tractable. Okay. And, and you know, again, what is the picture here? The picture is, uh, you know, uh, Perhaps what's happening is that you know, P is much bigger than N. So there is many more samples than, many more parameters than samples. So you have many solution of the system of equation, uh, Y is equal Fn of theta. Okay, so I'll call this the set of uh, interpolators or so called the set ERN zero. So this is the set of parameter theta in uh, RP such that Y equal to Fn theta. This is a system of N equation in P unknowns. And the idea is that, okay, perhaps what's happening is that since there is more unknown than equation, uh, this is a high dimensional manifold. So perhaps uh, this is a high dimensional. Manifold, uh, and so okay to to draw a picture. I draw this manifold in. So this is R P. This manifold looks something like this in the space of parameters, and then when you run gradient descent, you start. You know, some at some random point, and perhaps this random point, since this manifold is so high dimensional, is not too far from the manifold. So this is the manifold ERM zero, and so gradient descent converges quickly to a point here. Okay, so this is kind of a uh, so this a small green arrow is the dynamic of gradient descent. So this intuition is confirmed by empirical facts. For instance, the fact that if P is big, much bigger than N, we observe that typically, you know, gradient floor, gradient descent 
converges to zero empirical risk. So it's a global minimizer and theta k converges to some theta infinity or appears to converge, it depends on the initialization. So depending on the, on the point at which initialize, uh, as this cartoon shows, it will converge to a different point in the manifold. Okay, again, uh, um, you know, precisely understanding this, rigorously understanding this is still, I think, an, you know, largely an open question, uh, but there exists one regime in which this is well understood, and this is the linear regime. And this is you know, sometimes called also lazy or anti-K regime. This is what I will focus on. Oh, there is two questions. Yes. Um, I was wondering why it's called ERM zero rather than like, is the zero special or is there like, is this part of like a bigger story? Oh, uh, well, yeah. Okay. So this, first of all, this is not a commonly you know, accepted name. It's a name that I, uh, I think we use it, for instance, in this review, or etc. But okay, you can think of the following. You know, if you want it to be a little bit more detailed, so ERM zero, you can think of, you know, you can define it, of course, also as the set of point theta vector of parameters, such that the empirical risk is equal to zero, right? And uh, and of course, you can generalize this a little. Uh, you can generalize this uh, to ERM say delta to be the set of uh, points such that the empirical risk is less than delta, okay? So now this is a, a sub, so this is not a set of uh, solution of a set equation, but it's a sub-level set. And of course, if you want to understand optimization, probably you want to understand uh, the sub-level set and how it depends on delta, right? So for small delta, it can be a, a fattening of this. Uh, okay, let me use a nice color. So for small delta, this ERM delta will be a fattening of this manifold, but you know, other points might appear, might, might appear here. Okay, so this is my picture of ERM delta. And Hopefully you don't, you hope that not too many of these uh, purple spots appear in your, in your plot because that would mean that you can get easily trapped on non-global uh, empirical risk minimizers. Uh, professor, yeah. so, uh, so when, when we look at the, look at ERM zero, uh, you've said that if- the... I, don't, I don't see exactly who is speaking. Oh, sorry, I'm um, Rumil, uh, I'm, I'm actually- okay. Maybe okay, you okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So when we talk about ERM zero, uh, so we 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 will have a we will either have a set uh have a set of uh, thetas or or a specific theta, uh, as in the parameters that that the that, that provides us the ERM zero, right? So so when you say theta k is converging to something theta infinity, I'm I'm assuming you mean that it converges to some specific value of theta. Uh, or like some specific set of values of theta, which are optimal. Is it like that? Or it, it, like, uh, so you said depends on initialization. So can you explain that a bit, please? Okay, so here what uh, what I described here is, uh, is uh, uh, what is the picture, okay? The intuition, I mean, all of this is, is heuristic. And I, I'll try to describe the linear regime in which this can be made formal, but it's a very special regime. But heuristically, the idea is that, okay, there are many global empirical risk minimizers. So ERM zero is a big set, is a humongous set, is yeah. a, a manifold. You know, if there is no degeneracy, is, the, is a manifold of dimension P minus N, right? So this is this uh, red manifold, this is a sub-manifold, right? Now, if you sit at a point there, you have minimized the risk. So if you, if you if you run the gradient descent starting from a point in ERM zero, you don't, you don't move from that. 
Okay. Now, what you do in 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 you know, modern machine learning typically is that you start at the initialization that is random. So here in the picture, I I drew two random initialization, theta zero and theta zero prime. Okay. So what you observe empirically is that if you start at two random initialization, often you don't converge at the same point. You converge, you know, the network that you the networks that you learn depend on the initialization at which you start. This is an empirical finding. So these are empirical findings. And so it depends on the initialization on which you start. So let's say this is depends on the initialization, right? And this, this finding is consistent with this picture that I gave above. You know, if really the manifold of empirical risk minimizer is very large, you expect that you start at two different initialization and you end up at two different minimizers. And you know, I wanted just to contrast this to what is the standard picture in, in uh, you know, classical optimization or in classical you know, statistics in which the empirical risk is convex or perhaps is ball shaped. There is a unique minimizer. The sub-level sets are basically balls or very close to balls. And you know, regardless of where you start, you converge to the same point. So these two pictures are very different, okay? Okay. So this is to be contrasted with. The standard picture is that you have only ERM, the empirical risk minimizer is a point. And if you look at the sublevel set, the sublevel set is basically a ball around this point not quite a ball, but a convex set around this point. Okay. Uh, there were, sorry, sort of, there are several question. other questions. So perhaps I'll, I'll go in, in the order of where I see the hands raised uh, in my screen. So there was a question, actually there was a question by Darshil. Uh, yeah, that's me. So, uh, so I'll start a quick, a quick question about uh, the statement of the intuition. So, uh, is there, uh, are there any nuances or, or conditions on where you initialize uh, that could, that would lead you to uh, right. not, uh, not get, end up on one of those uh, zero ERM uh, points or curves? Uh, or yeah, so uh, is it that, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, I don't know. I mean, perhaps somebody has studied this systematically. I don't know all, all the, the numerical experiments that have been done about this, but I know it's a very simple thing that if you start off two random initialization with a standard way of initializing things, you don't learn the same network. This is a simulation that you know, I can show <laughs> even on my laptop, right? Uh, and, and there are papers and, and the first one also there is, there is simulation. So for instance, Nati and Misha and you know, there are many simulations showing that you converge to empirical risk zero. So this, this, um, yeah. Now your question, whether this happens for every possible initialization, my guess is no, that you can find, you know, if you search exhaustively over all possible initialization, probably there are very bad initialization that sure converge that to a bad local minimum, right? But, uh, but okay, I don't know. I don't know if there is any literature on that. Okay. There was yes. a question Just, about, uh, Quick, uh, quick follow up that uh, uh, like uh, in your guess, would this set be like a significant number or like a measure zero I sort of bad initialization or if you had to know. guess, okay. There is a question. I mean, the measure zero is very, very tricky, right? I mean, it depends on what, what the measure is, right? Perhaps Gadi has a question. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, um, you kind of put together in the same uh, boat GD and SGD in terms of uh, this behavior. And I wonder, obviously they would under certain conditions uh, behave slightly differently. And I wonder if there's kind of anything kind of uh, universal or uh, semi-universal to say about this. Uh, 
Okay, I, I don't have anything particularly smart to say about it, yeah. except that, okay, I can, I can for sure give you an algorithm that converges to a point that doesn't depend on the initialization. And that is simply you take uh, Langevin dynamics. And uh, so Langevin dynamics means that basically do you know, either GD or SGD, but I add isotropic noise at each step. Mm -hmm. And then, um, okay, so if, if I take the right limit of things, so limit of step size first to zero, and then, uh, and then the limit of you know, the, the noise going to zero, uh, you'll converge, you get a unique point, right? Because for any positive no noise, you will converge to whatever is the reversible measure for the Langevin dynamics, and then the limit, the zero temperature limit of this reversible measure is uniquely defined. So here you are an algorithm that nobody uses, but but as uh, no, doesn't satisfy this picture, okay, or, or, you know, behaves differently from GD. But okay, of course, this is very strange, because you know, a very artificial way of doing things, because you are taking the limits in a very specific order. Right. But anyway, the, the you, it seems like you on purpose kind of, uh, did not put any distinction between GD and SGD in this in this uh, context. It's basically I don't put any distinction out of ignorance, and and mainly because I'm interested, as you see, I, 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 you know, as I mentioned, I, I you know, I know very little, and I don't know we know much about the nonlinear case, and the case that we know better is the linear one for which we have more quantitative and precise claims. And, and this will be the focus of my lecture. So in the linear case, I can answer to a lot of your questions, right? Very precise, I mean, somewhat precisely. Um, okay, I see there are two more questions, which is great. <laughs> I'm out of uh, time almost. Okay, Milad. Or, uh, uh, yeah, hi. Please. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if you can uh, refer me to any good reference that studies the geometry of ERM0. Uh, well, one, one thing that I'm especially interested in is uh, like being high dimensional uh, does not necessarily explain ERM0 is kind of dense in, in our parameter space. So like it's close to any random initial point. Okay, so hopefully... Hopefully, this will be answered by by you know by the next thing that I'll talk about. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, but yeah, in general, the nonlinear geometry of it is quite complex. I mean, it's it's quite unknown. Okay, so let me let me perhaps uh, uh, pass to you know. Okay, so what I described before is kind of a, an intuition and is much broader than. You know, as often, you know, the intuition is very broad and what we actually know rigorously is relatively small. But, uh, okay, so let's, uh, so to introduce the re linear regime, perhaps the question to ask is what Milad mentioned, that is, let's say that I, I started at a random initialization. Okay, a random initialization. And let's ask ourselves, is there uh, a, a, a point in ERM0 close to uh, theta zero? I mean, I want to solve this system of nonlinear equations. It's very complicated. So I might as well take a random point and look for a solution around it, okay? So I, what I want to solve, I want to solve y equal fn theta. And as you see, there is nothing here that is about neural network. It's just a nonlinear set of equations, right? And okay, I'm close to theta zero. I took a calculus class. So I know, I know how to do Taylor expansions, okay? So let me do Taylor expansion, okay? So if I do Taylor expansion, Okay, I subtract from both sides f evaluated at theta zero. So this is of course f of theta, I want to solve this. 
And now I do Taylor expansion and what I get is the Jacobian of Fn at theta zero times theta minus theta zero plus the integral of So this is uh, you know, just, it's not even Taylor expansion, it's just the integral theorem of calculus. And now, okay, so this is a matrix. So this is an important matrix, the Jacobian and initialization is a very important matrix. So let me write it in red, I'll call it phi. And this is a matrix, what dimension is this? Is I dimension n by p, okay? And, and what, what I want to do, I want to call this, I want to treat this as an error term, okay? So I'll call this uh, E of theta e is for error, okay? And, and okay, let me add one, one more notation. Let me call this Y as Y tilde, okay? So this is the response minus whatever is my prediction at the initialization. Okay, so what I have, and, and what is this theta s here? Theta s is just the linear interpolation. So theta s is, is just equal to theta zero plus s times theta minus theta zero. Okay, so I rewrote this system of equation as y tilde equal phi times theta minus theta zero plus some error term. of theta, okay? So I claim, I want to claim that the error term is small to make things my life easy. So what, what is the error term bounded by? Well, if you think about it, this is, you can bound this by, morally what happens is that here you have a factor theta minus theta zero, okay, uh, here. And here you have this difference that you might always also expect of be of order theta minus theta zero. So you might expect that the norm of this error term is bounded by a constant times theta minus theta zero square. Okay, and what is the constant that, that makes this true? Uh, well, it's, it's just the Lipschitz constant of the Jacobian. And actually what you need is just a local Lipschitz constant. Ah, this is in operator norm. Okay, so now you have this, this system of equation in which I have a bound on E, okay? And now I want to, to find the solution of this system of equation, right? How do I go about doing that? Well, let's see if, if there wasn't any error term, what would be the solution that is closest to theta zero? Well, it would be, you just take the pseudo inverse, right? So if, if, if E was equal to zero by some magic, the solution of this system of equation would be that is closest to theta zero would be theta minus theta zero equal pseudo inverse of, of Y tilde. Okay, now the error term is not equal to zero. So I have to you know, give myself a little bit of, of room Okay, so I'll, I'll add a small error uh, delta. I'll add it here just because it simplifies a bit the calculation. And now I can just sub substitute. So the intuition is this. And what I really do is this. And now I substitute this up there. Okay, and what I get if I substitute this up there, um, is uh, 
is really I get the equation delta equal minus e of uh, theta zero plus phi pseudo inverse of y plus delta. Okay, now I call this f of delta. Now you have a fixed point equation for delta and show that it has one solution. Uh, how you do this? Well, but if I use, uh, if I use the, the solution here, okay, let me first pause. There are two questions already. Uh, perhaps Jose. Yeah, quick question. The phi, the pseudo inverse is not a random it's not random. We don't have to take expectation because the initialization is random. It's random, but uh, you know, for any random initialization, there is a matrix, a random yeah. variable. Okay, so we it's not necessary to take expectation over the the random. No. Okay. If if uh, x is equal to a random number times three time where times b b is equal to that random number inverse times x this is true as probabilists say is true per omega for any given realization now as you see most of these lectures are actually about studying the property of this phi matrix right but for any phi matrix there is a pseudo inverse right for any random realization there is a very well defined pseudo inverse Yes, perhaps uh, Brian. Had a Hi, yeah, Brian. Um, do, are you assuming here that the error lies within the rank of phi? Otherwise, I think you can't write this delta, can you? If there was a component of E that was outside of the rank of phi, you wouldn't get it with the delta. You see, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just trying to find a solution here. Now, this is not the only way of doing this calculation. I'm not trying to find every possible solution. I'm just trying to find one solution, right? Okay, all right. Um, so I can I can choose my own delta as long as I can prove that that you know there is a solution of this equation for delta, which I haven't yet shown. Okay, I want to show that there exists a solution for equation star star. Okay, thank you, Frederick. Uh, yeah, so. Just to make sure, like the pseudo inverse here is kind of arbitrary in a sense, right? In yeah, the sense yeah. of that your per parameterization is also maybe arbitrary, right? Yeah, so the pseudo inverse, you know, for our, this argument, this argument is, yeah, I cooked it up for this lecture to make things as simple as possible. Okay. But uh, yeah, you can, you can, yeah. Thanks. Aria. In the final row that you wrote with uh, delta equals minus e, does e stand for the error that we defined or expectation? E is the error. So it's this function. Let me call it calligraphic e. There is no expectation now. You can think that there is no probability. Okay, thank you. At the moment. Okay, let me let me perhaps uh, finish this argument, and then you can ask a question. Now, now I want to prove that star star is a solution. So, what I know about f, you know that the norm of f is less or equal than ln times phi pseudo inverse uh, y plus delta to norm square. This is by the bound on E. And just by triangular inequality, this is less than phi pseudo inverse Y to norm plus phi pseudo inverse operator norm times delta square. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, oh, I should have called this is F of delta really. It means that F maps the ball 
of radius r in uh, rn uh, to the ball of radius r prime where r prime is equal to ln times phi pseudo inverse y2 plus operator norm of phi r square. Okay, so you have a ball r and uh, you know f maps it into another ball r prime centered at zero. Now, what does this mean? If r prime, r prime depends of r, is less than r, we are in business, right? Because by, by the fixed point equation, there exists a solution. Uh, there exists a solution. by the Brouwer's fixed point theorem. Right? So you do your, your algebra and you observe that, uh, okay, I will not do uh, the algebra here, but this happens if you take R equal, so it works out if uh, R is equal to, let me copy from the, my notes, L N times phi dagger y uh, tilde and 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 if ln is less than one over four times okay so, so the, the, there is a solution close to theta zero if these two conditions are satisfied, okay? Let me, I mean, if the second condition is satisfied and the first tells me how close it is to theta zero. So let me a moment look at this condition. Again, I will not, this is just trying to provide some justification to what I'll do in the other lecture. So, uh, but, but let me spend a minute looking at these conditions. Uh, this condition. So what does it mean? Uh, does it make sense? Well, it says that the Lipschitz constant of, of the Jacobian is small. So what is the Lipschitz constant of the Jacobian? Uh, okay, morally is something like the second derivative with respect to the parameter of the function of the model. Right? So it makes sense so that if the second derivative of the model is small, the model is approximately lin linear and therefore, you know, probably you can find the solution of this system of equation. Uh, Andrea? Are you sure you mean operator norm in that second term of the denominator? Is that L2? Ah, no, no, L2 norm, sorry. Thank you. I'm sure I don't mean operator norm. This is a vector. Now, I must say that for a vector, the operator norm, you know, if you view the vector as a matrix. <laughs> okay. Okay, like just uh, so, so at, a, at a high level, this condition says, um, so, and what is phi? Phi is the linearization of the model, right? Okay, so, so at high level this says, if the model is approximately linear, then you can find the solution by the, basically taking the pseudo inverse of the, the Jacobian, which makes sense. And uh, one sanity check is basically scaling. This condition is invariant under scaling. If I scale, so the left-hand side is dimension f over theta square, and the right-hand side is, uh, is uh, again, one, and then this is f over theta is uh, minus one, because I'm taking pseudo inverse and another f over theta minus one, okay? 
So if I scale f by a constant or theta by a constant, this, this, uh, ah, and there is another f because of the y. Okay. So if I scale f by constant or theta by a constant, then then the condition doesn't change. So the the condition makes sense. Uh, there there is a question, Andrew. Yeah, it's actually about the, so. You left it as the pseudo inverse times y and then the L2 norm. Um, but it seems like with what you just wrote, we're just going to think of it as like the operator norm times the operator norm times the L2 norm of y. So is there like a reason we don't just pull it off in the above? Uh, I must say that you are perfectly right in the sense that if you look at this kind of condition in the literature, there is that, uh, that splitting. OK. But in general, I don't see it necessary at least for this conclusion so i decided just to quote the tightest condition so as far as i know in the papers you know you see this kind of weaker condition of or relatives of this condition and also if you find the, look at the paper with but now preparing the lecture at least for this specific question that is existence of solution i don't need to 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 do the, that inequality so i brought the titles condition so i leave myself for a homework to try to see whether i can derive any interesting <laughs> consequences from okay sure, thank you so now now of course the question is is this condition satisfied if you take um, for instance a two uh, layer neural network um, and uh, uh, so is this condition satisfied uh, for instance by uh, you know the two layer neural network that uh, we we described before so alpha Uh, and the answer is depends, right? Uh, and uh, okay, I will not do into go into the calculation, but the answer is yes in some cases. In particular, if you take alpha equal, for instance, alpha zero over square root of n, which is the standard scaling in the i, say plus minus one or constant, and then the wi random. Uh, let me not go into describing precisely this, but typically it works if I take either alpha zero large or n large with this this uh, with this specific scaling of things, right? Uh, so you can you can look at the precise condition in the review paper with Bartlett and, and uh, Racklin, and there are many other papers that give similar conditions. Uh, but uh, I will not go into this because my interest in this linearized model is, I would say, more as a metaphor for what actually happens in neural network than, than as, as an actual approximation. Right? In practice, we know that there are gaps between this linear theory and what happens in neural network. But, uh, but uh, you know, by studying linear network, I think you, there is a lot of interesting things that happen and, and phenomena that happen. And, and those phenomena uh, really transfer to actually neural network. Okay, so I don't know. Now I'm I'm over with time, so perhaps perhaps I'll stop and I'll, I'll finish. There are a few other things that I wanted to to do, but I'll do them perhaps tomorrow. Okay. If you wanted to take another minute or two, Andrea, I mean, no. there's some time, but you know, we can also it's, just. It's, sort of it's fine it's fine i mean i'll cover them tomorrow i think i think it's good that we had some some questions okay, so, well, so there is one well so perhaps i you know one question okay perhaps what i can do in one minute is just give a, a plan of of these lectures okay so what is out, the outline i think this is useful to do very briefly uh so okay i will have to so lecture one was models motivation So I'll, I'll, I'll finish this, then I'll, I'll, so this motivates me to study 
you know, this kind of linear or linearized models. So in lecture two, I study the simplest possible one that is the case of Gaussian features. This is very simple, but you know, it's, it's interesting and, and there is nice math there, etc. Then I'll do kernel re ridge regression in high dimension. Then a random feature models. Models only one L. And, and, and finally lecture five, I'll, I'll close the loop and get back to, uh, okay, what is the NT model? And what I'll do for in each of these cases, two to five is for each of these models. So these are kind of increasingly complicated models, try to characterize the risk, the, pre the test error. So characterize. So lecture one, there was, and there is not, you know, for what I finished, there is no probability, but from two to five, uh, okay, that would be almost only probability. <laughs> the statistics. There was one question, I don't know if I should, perhaps, Sidak. Yeah, hi. Um, so I think whenever you're saying, uh, li uh, you're dealing with linear model, you mean a linearization of the network, right? Yeah, so linear is linear in the parameters. Yeah, and, and another thing, so uh, is there a particular choice of non-linearity that you will assume? No. It's independent as, you, as, as you'll see, you know, all the results, okay, there is no non-linearity in lecture two, but for three to five, all the results hold very, very generically and depend on the linear non-linearity only in, in a very kind of simple way. Okay, of course, you, know, you can take the degenerate non-linearity type, like take sigma of t equals t, <laughs> then, then that is a degenerate case and most of the things that I say don't apply, but I'll give you the conditions. Thank you. Uh, hi, Professor Montanari. Perhaps I should, I mean, there are a few other questions, Boris, I don't know what I should do if there is something else after this. No, so, so there's, there's plenty of time. There's still another like 25 minutes. So I suggest we just say thanks for the very nice lecture. And then if you're willing to stay, I think it'd be great if you answer questions, why not? Okay, <laughs> okay, I'll answer a couple of more questions perhaps. Perhaps Sam. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm just wondering in the story up here for the condition being satisfied, are we going to, um, do we need like an assumption on the data too? Are we thinking like data on the sphere or? Uh, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, okay, so this condition, as you see, this condition depends, for instance, one, one key thing that it depends on is the operator norm. If you, if you look at, the, at it here, for instance, this kind of condition depends on the operator norm of, of, the pseudo inverse so depends on lambda mean, the minimum singular or sigma mean better, the minimum singular value, let's call it as mean, the minimum singular value of phi, right? Uh, now the minimum singular value of phi depends on the distribution of W and the distribution of, of X. And now, okay, uh, if you look at, uh, at the result in the review, uh, I think that we state a result under the assumption that these xi are perhaps uniform on the sphere. Hello. Uh, square root of d. And uh, for instance, there is a paper of uh, uh, Madi, Sultano Kotabi, and, and uh, Sameto Imak that gives deterministic condition. So this. You know, the, these are some assumptions, and then you have to assume something about the distribution of the W. Well, this is a bit easier because you can take whatever you use at initialization. So typically you take W or, so this is the standard initialization or, or you know, for some math, you take it uniform on the sphere that is almost the same, right? So initialization of the W for, for 
you know, if it is a fully connected network is, is pretty much, much fixed. And now the axis, of course, is a, you know, again, it's a question of, uh, you know, again, in, in some paper, you, we assume some deterministic condition on the axis, in other, you take them random. But, okay. There are sorts of results there. Perhaps I'll take one last question, Young, the question. Hello. Hello. Okay, I have a question. Is there, um, uh, you, you, uh, you play the five the points, but the last one, the NT model, please uh, say again, what's meaning the NT model or, or and uh, which the kind of the real, uh, collected RF model? So because of the before I, I didn't uh, catch your point. So please uh, uh, appreciate again, thank you. So the NT model, I mean uh, the model that is obtained by linearizing two layers neural network. Uh, so, the, the, the same as the neutral network? The? The neutral network, right? The machine is one the algorithm in the machine learning. So, so what I mean by NT model, I mean neural tangent model. So it's, it's just the model that they obtain by linearizing this function. Okay, okay, another function. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor. Okay. Um, there is, oh, <laughs> perhaps, uh, Kevin. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, so we've shown that um, when we bound this L sub n value, we can guarantee that we're close to an element of ERM zero. Mm -hmm. So, but for the tractability intuition, we wanted it to be locally convex around this initialization point, such that that minimum um, in that convex neighborhood happened to be an element of ERM zero. Where in this discussion is the local convexity kind of coming from? Is my question. Uh, okay, good question. So, um, so if you think about it, what what now I showed kind of I didn't show it fully, but you know, what this argument suggests is that under this condition, basically, you can solve this system of equation approximating it with a linear system of equation. Right, I didn't really talk about the distance. I approximate in the system of equation with a linear system of equation, right? And uh, okay, so so the the strengthening or generalization of this that is in the literature is that you don't not only approximate the system of equation, but you optimize the cost or the model by a model that is linear in the parameters and. Uh, and uh, once the model is linear in the parameters, then, then the cost, since it's quadratic in the model, becomes quadratic in the parameters. And so you get the kind of local convexity. Um, again, I'll, I'll briefly, I'll discuss a bit more this, you know, I meant to do it in this lecture, but went over time, but I'll discuss this a little bit in the beginning of the next lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, I guess I'll thanks everybody. I'll thank everybody and uh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow morning. morning. Okay, thanks very much for the lecture again, Andrea. Okay, thanks, see bye. you. See you. Okay, um, as I mentioned on the Slack, if you guys are on it, the next thing is happening in about 19 minutes. Um, it'll be our first It'll be our first uh, symposium in about 19 minutes, same Zoom link. So I'll, I'll see you all hopefully there.
I like the new background atlas. Hi, Bori. Hey. We're just gonna give people a minute to arrive. No, I got that. I got all the talk nowadays will be late for at least five minutes, so I have prepared for that. <laughs> That's fair. No, I, we, we built in some time um, between each thing just for, for precisely such a purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's actually slowly get started. Um, so, so welcome everybody to our first of three mini symposia. Uh, part of the thought when organizing the summer school was I thought it'd be good to have kind of exposure to exciting ideas and approaches, some of which are much more applied than the main courses we have. Um, and so I sort of organized these three symposia and it, it's really nice in this first one to be leading off with Atlas Wong. So Atlas uh, got his PhD in 2016 from UIUC and he's now a professor in electrical and computer engineering at UT Austin. I met, Aust uh, I met Atlas when we were both professors at Texas A&M and I've learned quite a bit from him over the years about neural networks. So this should be very interesting. And I guess he'll tell us about understanding and accelerating neural architecture search with training free and theory grounded metrics. Please take it away, Atlas. Thank you, Boris. Thanks for the introduction, kind of introduction. And I should point out uh, for the promos that uh, the pleasure has always been mine to talking with Boris and to pick his uh, super smart brain as uh, many of you perhaps already know. So today my talk, uh, well, to lead, I, I, I would really be hesitant to say I would lead off this symposium because you would perhaps hear something of very different flavor from my talk or from most of the talks you are hear from this uh, very solid some school. I'll talk about how a practitioner see those theoretical tools and try to make it a little bit useful uh, for the applications that we have at hand and see how we could mitigate the gap. So today I will talk about uh, uh, how we use uh, several deep learning theory metrics uh, to understand and accelerate uh, a beautiful application in practice called uh, neural architecture search. And uh, as many of you can guess, uh, I'm uh, doing nothing but shamelessly taking credit from two of my excellent PhD students, Wu Yang Chen and Xin Yu Gong, who are real heroes behind this work. Uh, let's get started with uh, something that everybody more or less seems to know. So if we look back into the first five years, so let's say to, um, from 2012 to 2017, there was perhaps one thing that most people are most obsessed with, that is, uh, let's try to design and come up with some novel or similarly novel building blocks or architectures for deep learning. Architectures or its building blocks are considered as a powerhouse of deep learning. And uh, in the, the first five years, uh, people have been getting a lot of progress by just being incorporating various kinds of uh, smart ideas uh, from trying arrows uh, to improve the architecture, from AlexNet to GoogleNet, VGG, ResNet, DenseNet, uh, and from different building blocks uh, like the important ones, including batch normalization, squeeze that excitation, residue connections, and so on. So gradually, this is a this is, a this is getting complicated, right? And gradually, gradually after a few years, people start to realize that, uh, hey, we cannot continue that way because uh, the network has been beyond anybody's manual engineering effort. It has become such a gigantic monster that we don't know how to grow it further. So how to grow machine learning? The answer people try to provide after five years of, high, of uh, tried error is, let's use machine learning to grow machine learning. I'm not sure this is a philosophically right, but that's how people start to do in the second round. So the research question here is uh, whether we can try and learn good architectures automatically, and that leads to the now renowned field called uh, neural architecture search. Um, Frank, uh, to be fair, if uh, we talk uh, neural architect talk about neural architecture search in detail, I, we could easily make a tutorial lasting three three hours in CVPR or ICML to cover all the reasons from fields. So we will not do that for today. Uh, I will just uh, use a high level uh, conceptual diagram to give you whoever. Uh, if you don't work in this field, I'm just trying to give you a rough idea how this field is doing and what the, the landscape of this field is looking like. So to do a neural, arch neural architecture search is essentially not too much different from other search or sampling problem. To conduct a neural architecture search problem, we would need three components. Number one is called a search space. 
say, uh, say you have to define what's the range of architectures that you wanted to search from, you want to search the best one from. Well, if you tell me you want to search from all the neural networks ever possible being crafted in the world, then you are creating an intractable problem, right? That's infinite. So you have even a defined for, for the defined for some reason. That definition could be from a resource or other design budget constraint. For example, I want to choose from any network that have one more than five million parameters. Yeah, that is one way to specify that. Or you could have incorporated other design patterns, saying that uh, I want all the subnetwork from ResNet, the, well, who, I want all the network who can be a subnetwork of ResNet 100. This is also another way to specify it. But anyway, you have to specify a constraint. And uh, in the practice, we usually define with a set of operators uh, or connectivity patterns. So the search space is any neural network that can be composed or built with those operators and connectivity patterns and maybe under certain complexity constraint. Overall, this is the set of architecture you allow yourself to look at. So the second thing is a search strategy. We'll talk about more about search strategy later, but basically you can consider it's a sampling way from this big search space. And you will learn this sampler together with the, 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 during this process. So after you build on a defined search space, we will conceptually perform this iterative two steps. We will use the search strategy to give a sampler and pick architecture from the search space based on some criterion or based on distribution or whatsoever. And based on the sample we currently get, we will do a performance evaluation step to understand how well we did in this past sampling step. This performance estimation could be uh, and mostly be uh, a test set accuracy. And it can, it can also be extended, for example, to network stability, to uh, joint consideration with the various kind of efficiency from parameter count to uh, inference cost to even hardware energy cost, uh, anything you want to be used to assess the fitness, the goodness of the network. And this will be returned as a kind of feedback or reward to the sampler. And the sampler will adjust its own strategy and iterate until you're satisfied what we will sample at this round. So based on this high level conceptual description, you may see that the NAS could have many mathematical hats to wear. For example, you could consider this as a constrained optimization problem. Although in its native form, this problem is perhaps not continuous because you are selecting from a discrete set of architecture candidates. There are apparently ways that you could try to learn a continuous embedding to represent this search space. But yeah, this takes some extra work and it will have some constraint to play with. This performance estimation will provide you the update function you will need to solve in the, the object function you need to solve in this constraint set. If, from, if, you are, if you are a statistician, this is apparently also very much like a sequential sampling and a Bayesian optimization problem, and people do use those tools to, to solve the NAS question. So with those three components defined, search space, search strategy, and performance estimation, most of the NAS research work has been focused on how to design the search strategy or a sampler or an optimizer in this search space. There have been many methods, for example, because the search space by design is a discrete space, it's not very hard to think of, let's use evolution optimization, Bayesian optimization, and reinforcement learning to search within this space. And more recently, people have come up with smart ideas to make this search space differentiable, and people even find that if you have a large enough space and a good enough sampling budget, a random search isn't that bad as well. So, there are a lot of there are a lot of common methods that be seen things into this critical bottleneck, this critical bottleneck search strategy. There are a lot of papers being published every year. So with that, by the way, I'm uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh to break in and just uh, ask me any questions because I'm using full screen. I'm perhaps not looking, uh, checking the chat box very frequently. Or oh, Boris, if you see any question, you think you should interrupt me, just feel free to interrupt. All right, and all right, so. How so? People love people love NAS. Well, at least engineering people love NAS. There is a reason. And the, well, actually, if you now to go to talk to any big company, big players, uh, there is a very high probability you will find someone approximately working the NAS domain, because the performance, first of all, is very promising. For example, if you look at one of the first NAS paper, the NAS Net from Google, published in 2017, CPR, it performs on par. Uh, it's uh, if I don't remember wrong, it's uh. 
39 layers of the new, neural network. But its performance can already be on par with a 100 layer dense net, the state of art network then. So with only 40% of the layers. And uh, I think it uh, also takes 25 less parameters. And uh, when you implement that on a mobile phone, it inference, inference, is the inference latency is 5% faster. So it's better, it's faster, it's smaller. So what else you could request for that? It's apparently very promising and motivating. So, and with the progress of the NAS method, you could discover a very high performance model. Although those models are not, uh, I have to admit that uh, the, those performance are not very necessarily beautiful and are definitely far away from being well comprehended because it's usually touch much more complicated than the manual design would touch. To give you what I mean by the complicated here, let me show you one example. <laughs> Okay, so if you have never seen a NAS network, this is the one example ever discovered by a NAS architecture. Uh, I don't know whether ser any theoretical people want to look into how this neural network is actually working. Uh, so this is from a paper called SMASH, F-A-A-S-H, published in iClear 2018. So, uh, <laughs> so, the re so now I guess you should side with me that uh, those NAS search results are not really well comprehended. So people are wondering that besides all those uh, exciting empirical performance we have observed, people are really wondering whether, well, the success of NAS is because there are some strong and general design rules that we really don't know. And the NAS are telling us from data, discovering that from data. So there are some strong form of rules that could lead to neural network look really like mess like this, but there are strong rules, there are good rules. All is simply because we are just overfitting our problem. Is it just because we are using some data set or some task metric to search our architecture and to overfit this data, as you see, this is, can be a kind of overfitting too. Is it just because this very irregular architecture just happen to work in the specific data and the specific choice that you work on and it does not really convey any generalizable rules. So we don't know our success is a wing of first principle or a wing, or a wing of empirical performance. I would say it's rather rather under, under, underestimated and poorly understood in this empirical domain. So this page is, uh, I am just trying to use this one page to give you a high level, uh, high level overview of the NAS field. So if I don't get any questions here, I would proceed. Uh, um, that would be the, yeah. I Sorry. have a question about, so whenever you have this NAS sort of set up, this framework, the, so this is like some algorithm to figure out what the um, architecture should be. So is that only based on the data that you're given? Like if you, if I give you like a, like a giant data set, you will you be trying to produce a neural network that would uh, work like estimate well on that, or is there anything else that goes into like the the framework, like any other inputs in this like algorithm? Okay, okay, good question. So for most of the NAS papers, uh, the goal is to give you a gigantic data set and let a model work best on that data set. Although some of the papers will also offer a transferability study, but the transferability is often limited to rather, I would say rather similar data set. For example, if you search a data model work on CIFA 10 and test whether it works well on CIFA 100 and usually it will, you know, went through really well, but uh, it doesn't mean a lot to me. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, so yeah, if I don't get more- Professor? Oh, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, professor, can you, can you please explain like what is your search space? Like, and oh. The search space, uh, as I have explained, uh, is any specification you want uh, your, it's a constrained set you want your, 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 your architecture selection to be from. For example, it, I said it could be any neural network under certain parameter count. It could be any neural network that can be set, that can be selected as a sub-network from ResNet 100. I'm just giving two simple examples. And in practice, that is often defined to give you a a set of units like a convolution, convolution one times one, convolution three times three, batch normalization, residue connection, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, unit operators like that, and uh, any network that can be composed with these basic building blocks and under certain complexity constraint could be considered within that search space. And that's a more practical way to define that. Yeah. How do you? Uh, can you give me a toy example and how do you represent this search space with the toy example? Uh, I understand uh, intuitively I, what is the search space, but like, uh, how do you sure represent you, it? I'm not sure if, uh, how, uh, what, what do you mean by the representation? So if you mean that uh, how we 
let them be fed into those numerical sampler, then yeah, we have a typical, we have several ways to numerically encode that. For example, if you have defined the network, each, each position could be selected from a finite set of operators, then you could use a one hot encoding to indicate which operator is selected as its location, and the whole network could be a cascade of that one hot encoding. And there have been more ways, for example, people use LSTM to encode the cascaded architecture into a numerical vector. The, there are several popular ways and a kind of application dependent. I see. Uh, thank you, Professor. Yeah, uh, I'm just thank wondering, you. like, is the search space considers all the possible architectures? Like, if it is so, how it's being represented, or is it from just a set that picks up one architecture? Is it a discrete well, set or continuous set or it's what is? Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a discrete set. I perhaps don't know how to represent uh, 0.75 convolution <laughs> convolution filters in a network. So yes, and uh, that discrete uh, discrete search space is essentially one reason why it makes search more difficult. Okay, so let's go to the next page. So uh, look at so if we look at the three component here, the search space, the search strategy, and the performance estimation, the most underestimated thing in us is perhaps how to estimate the performance because it looks so apparent, okay? Well, if you, I ask you to design, uh, the, the design a performance estimator without a second thought, uh, then the easy answer is just to get architecture and try that and get the test accuracy, right? But if you think of this process, uh, Think of what we are talking about. We are trying to search for a gigantic search space and try to find a model that performs well on a gigantic model, on a gigantic data set. So the model has to be big and it's training need to take a huge amount of time. So this architecture, so if you define, let's say definition one, if you define a good architecture roughly equal the architecture that can be trained to achieve the low test error on your evaluation set, that means you will need by evaluating each time, uh, by evaluating the, the output of your sampling each time, you need to do a full deep network training. And we are talking about the really deep networks in the practical NAS scenario. Uh, so this would this, 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 this would be, I guess, very clearly, very expensive and slow. Considering now you are not training one architecture, you need to sample and evaluate, sample and evaluate, and each evaluator, you need to train them. So if you are already complaining, well, your lab do not have enough resource to train one or two architectures, and now think about training one, 2,000 architectures in one experiment run. That's what makes NASA extremely expensive for many academic labs. And uh, those, so, but most of the evaluation ways, depending on that, cannot escape from this shortcoming. And also they were dependent on specific data and label set. So why we could use a larger data set to try to gain the transferability of the found architecture? We're really not sure about that. And the larger data set you use, the more you are creating budget for your training. So it's really not that scalable. Also, this training process doesn't give us interpretability about why this network is being chosen, but not its neighbors, because you just use training, you just use evaluation error. And if you also think of how deep network the training has its own uncertainty, different training recipes, different Hebrew parameters, random initializations, five independent runs may give you different test accuracy. This will create extremely noisy reward, uh, the re re reward, of sample, uh, the re reward of sampling scores for your search method and the further complicating the stability of the search, the interpretability of the search in addition to the budget of the search. So why we're saying this is not good, well, this is not really a good, a good way to think of it. Let's think of what, let's take a step back and think of what we really want. Look at this approximate equal. Now the, 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 the practice is we are trying to check our architecture that can be trained at low test accuracy. But uh, what we really want is a good architecture, a good architecture that can generalize under the, the, the generalize under the current data set training. So we do not. What we really want is not a test error, a validation error. What we want is a, a way, a, either a surrogate way or more principled way to probe this architecture's fitness, how good it is. So if we could have. Uh, a pro for a performance indicator that can characterize this model's promise. Say, if I could predict how well this model can be trained, how well the model can represent a complicated function, and how well that representation could generalize, 
training or validation is not necessary if we could have the performance indicators available. And I guess starting from there, you are you will find this start to draw connections with what we have been investigating in deep learning theory. And I call that, uh, can we make NAS fall in love at the first sight without doing the long evaluation? I'm saying that because uh, let's say we consider NAS as a process of finding the one you love. And this is often a trying and error process. The model evaluation is, is, let's say, it's like the dating part, which takes time. So we ask, so can we make love, can we make, make not, enough to fall in love at the first set without uh, twisting in that long dating process called the model evaluation? I'm not sure this is the right call for human relationship, but that is for now. And I think that's certainly a worthy goal to pursue that. Now let's take a look at the technical part. We have been thinking of uh, what do you mean by a good architecture? And the first thing we have looked at uh, several metrics. The first indicator metric that we have a look at, we call the trainability, or defined as how well a neural network can be optimized by the de facto algorithm now that is a gradient descent. Well, this trainability is related to depth, but not fully so. For example, although BGG is a shallow and ResNet, well, ResNet is actually easier to train. I think uh, many people sitting here have been knowing the NDK, so I'm, uh, I, I'm doing very brief on the background. So NDK has been uh, so NDK has been explored uh, by many prior works uh, to show that the wide neural network can evolve as a linear models using gradient descent. And uh, one classical work uh, by Lee in 2019 has showed that the training dynamics under the NDK view could be controlled by ODEs uh, that can be solved uh, by this uh, training dynamics equation. Here, this mu tx is the expected output of an infinitely wide net neural network, and NDK can be calculated uh, by the gamma by the gamma uh, so by this inner product of of this Jacobi matrix, uh, well, each of this, uh, so each of this point is evaluated at the point of parameter set alpha, and the ZRL is the output of the ice neuron in the last output layer, the L's layer. So this is just a standard definition of the NDK. And uh, given the NTK matrix, uh, several works, I, I remember one work by Xiao and his co-authors has shown that uh, if you look at the NTK norm, it actually tells a lot about the training behaviors of the network. For example, if you look at, the look at this NTK matrix and measure the condition number, because each of the eigenvalues represent one of the moves during the training dynamics, and uh, this lambda zero, the largest eigenvalue represent the fastest training the mood and the, the smallest and the smallest using the, and the slowest use the smallest mode. So if you empirically measure the conditional value between the two, that gives you an idea how, so because the different mode indicate the neural network the speed of learning of the different component in the training data. A lower conditional number could indicate empirically that the neural network is perhaps more fairly learning different component of the training data without a bias. That is a I'm fully average leveraging all the data component without being biased. And we are trying to treat this as a healthy property about the trainability. So we measure this, so we compute this NTK conditional number for our untrained neural network at its random initialization and further compute its conditional number. To give a proof of concept, we have used a new, new uh, standard benchmark in neural architecture search called NAS Bench 201 and compute the NTK conditional number with uh, the conditional number and draw that with regard to the final achievable accuracies in that big uh, benchmark. We are able to see that, uh, so you, as you can see from this finger, this x-axis is the NDK conditional number, and the y-axis is the final accuracy that those architecture can be trained to achieve on the CIFA 100 benchmark. Overall, if you look at the global trend, it's indeed uh, there exists uh, some very large NDK condition number networks uh, denoted by those outlier dots on the right, and their accuracy are pretty poor on CIFA 100 as well. The more you go towards the lower NDK conditional number and the higher accuracy it generally appears to be able to achieve. And if you are zooming this top left, top left end, which represents the highest accuracy subset on this benchmark, you will find that they generally align well on this, on this small subset, they generally align well with the NDK smallness and the best architectures are on the smallest NDK conditional number side. We have computed the Pearson coefficient on this benchmark. Overall, we are seeing uh, nearly point, uh, point, uh, point, uh, point, point, point 0.42 on the entire benchmark. 
benchmark. So this is a global, the global Pearson coefficient. And if we just look at this top left, I think we get somewhere close to 0.6. It's not a very strongly linear correlated, but it shows it contains a good deal of information to indicate the trendability. And therefore we have treated that our first empirical indicator. Let me stop here for a while and see if I get any question on this page. Because I think I'm perhaps using uh, those theories in some somehow unjustified, unjustified practitioner's view. So I would, would rather wait for a second for question. For computing the condition number, are the eigenvalues the eigenvalues of the NTK kernel? That is correct. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and uh, we would also point out that although we didn't mention that, uh, we find that there are several norms of the NTK that can be indicative of the trainability and the finally achievable accuracy on this benchmark. For example, you can also, it's also safe for you to, to, to compute uh, the, 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 the trace norm of the NTK. And we find it's also somehow correlated. And we are trying to uh, look at the different views of the NTK. We don't claim this is the optimal solution, but uh, certainly what we can claim is uh, the NTK kernel's spectrum seem to contain a lot of useful information positively correlated with its positive, uh, with the final accuracy of the network when evaluated at the beginning. I actually have a question for you, Atlas. Um, Please. When during training are you evaluating the condition number? Time zero. Got it. Do you, do you get a different answer if you evaluate it later in training? Do you get better or worse correlation, or are you not sure, maybe? Uh, I'm not sure, maybe, but also. Notice that uh, we intentionally do not do that because we want to lower down the sampling evaluation cost. So if you train that a short bit, uh, that uh, regardless of getting benefits or not, it's uh, sacrificing a bit of efficiency. And when you it's multiply with a thousand times of sampling, it's adding a lot. So we intentionally avoid doing that. Yeah, that's fair. Thanks. Do I have more questions on this page? Um, I have a question. So uh, I'm just wondering, like right now, NTK does not take into account the label. So this indicator is completely independent of what your labels might be. You might have, this might be uh, an indicator, like your labels could be uh, with, with noise as well, right? So how do you, that, maybe you have an indicator which takes into account that? That is true. And uh, you actually hit a point of my interest. I personally, without any, justification believes that uh, good architecture are mostly data related, uh, not that uh, task or label specific. That could, be, could, that could be demonstrated by the very high reusability of uh, popular computer vision architectures like ResNet also. And I think uh, one strong benefit of those popular architectures is uh, just one, one side of that is a, strong, is a strong friendliness to gradient propagation. I'm just sharing my personal view here, but uh, right. what I'm trying to say is uh, I think this trainability is uh, correct to say it's uh, perhaps not that uh, correlated with the task or specific label. And you're right, we don't use labels here. And also another follow-up. So uh, have you taken a look at the uh, particular, at the ones which have a higher condition number, what kind of models they are? Maybe they are the ones where like widths and depths are completely strained. So exactly this does not happen and the rest oh, of the yeah, correlation that makes very... sense. Yeah, that's a very good question. We did look at some of those outlier architectures. When they fit, find, we found that they are generally very wide architectures, extensively use a complicated convolutions, but not a skip connection. So the gradient must be very heavy to propagate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very good question. Uh, Please. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so my question is that, uh, could you comment on the computational trackability of uh, computing this number? because um, to my knowledge, it's quite difficult to, to compute uh, the kernel, the empirical kernel for large networks. Well, I think we are, I, I, I think the computation, computation here is a uh, five. I think if I don't remember wrong, I, I need to double check back with the code. I think uh, we are computing for one of the, for, for, for because this search space, especially is using cell-based search space, which means it's repeatedly stuck the same architecture for the same, the same the similar computational graph for each layer. So I think we compute for one layer, for example, but I, I'm not uh, absolutely sure on this. I need to check back. But the one comment I would add that I, I'm 
I, I, if you could send an email, I would be happy to get back to you. But one comment I have to add on that is, uh, however expensive this computing NDK is, it's definitely not as expensive as training a neural network itself. So I think it's a good bargain regardless. Thanks. Uh, could you also comment, uh, have you tried uh, this uh, analytical NDK so that it doesn't depend on the data too, it's just uh, so is that, oh, I know, I know what you're talking about. We haven't tried that yet. I am aware of this work, uh, and uh, we actually have some follow-up work trying to a larger range of theoretical metrics. So I think that yes, that could be tried. I will actually take a note for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one question regarding the conditional number: Are you using a particular algorithm to approximate the eigenvalue? Because this can be also kind of expensive. Yeah, I believe we use a power iteration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if no more question, let me proceed to the next page. So trainability is the number one thing that we seem to be like, but uh, on the other, but the trainability is not the full picture we are pursuing because a very simple function could be super easy to train, but what do we want, right? So on the other hand, we also want the network would be representative enough so it could be expressive. It could represent a complicated function with a good approximate, with low approximation error. So we call that expressiveness. So the expressiveness will quantify how complex a function a neural network could represent. Among many metrics, let's pair our kudos to the organizer for us who has created one, one tool, one useful tool, who has been working on this one useful tool called the number of uh, linear regions. So for ReLU networks, the input space could be partitioned into distinct the space, uh, pieces, and each of those pieces is associated with a set of uh, front parameters. The functions represented by the neural network uh, will be affine when restricted into its piece. And so uh, we call that a linear region, and therefore it is natural to measure the expressiveness of ReLU network uh, by looking at uh, how many pieces of linear region it could separate from this input. So in our work, uh, we didn't create anything new in this input in this input region theory. We just leveraged that great tool has developed by Boris and his colleagues and represented and, and, and measures the number of linear regions. What we do in a practical network is we will measure that we, we will repeat the measurement of number of regions by sample the network parameters from uh, chemical norm initialization. We'll just uh, do that uh, uh, either three times or five times, I, I don't remember the code, but we will repeat a few times. And for each time, we will use a small, a small, a small dimensional input that could be just a really tiny thumbnail style image and use that as approximate to fit forward through a different random initialization weight and get the number of linear regions and average to approximate that expectations. So we are similar to what we did for the NTK condition number. We also tried to we also plotted this correlational plot with the x-axis with number of linear regions on expectation and y being the test accuracy to achieve on the CIFA 10 and on the CIFA 100 image. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I think I forgot to put this uh, zooming finger here. But overall, the observation is quite similar with what we observed for the NTK case. Globally, it seems a clear trend that uh, we do see some very the very low accuracy outliers in this search space that are also very poor in the number of the indicator, sorry, in the number of linear regions they can represent. And in general, as the network become more and more capable to capture to partition the input space to more linear regions going to the right, the test accuracy in general grows higher as well. And remember, we have a zooming finger here to show on the top right corner, you also see the same stronger correlation as which means that the correlation become even stronger when you go to that top region. So this is become our, and the global Kita talk cover, Kita talk coefficient is a 0.5 on, in this example. So this, in addition to NDK, become a NDK condition number because our same, uh, become our second theory based indicator and it's try to quantify a different aspect uh, that is how expressive the network is. So with those two indicators uh, in hand, uh, we are already equipped with the basic tools we need to quant how to quantify a network's promise the fitness without actually training that. So our idea here is if a network is expressive, which means it can com represent a complicated function and trainable, which means that it could practically attain that good representation. Then those two seem to add a bit together to, add a bit together to a good network that we want. 
But actually, this is not the full definition. I will, I will jump back to this uh, definition to tell you what is the short of. But at, that, at this moment, let's first take this definition. We treat a good architecture to be an architecture that is expressive, so it can represent the complicated things, and a trainable, so it can attain that complicated things. With those two, we have the two theoretical metrics that we want to represent without training. And a few practical gaps we need to conquer need to conquer before actually using that. So first, we have the two indicators, how to combine them together. So we have figured out that those two metrics indicate condition numbers, and uh, the condition numbers and linear metrics have a very different numerical magnitude. So instead of directly adding that numerical value together, which really doesn't make sense, we have we instead compute the relative rankings of architectures of the two metrics within a sample batch. Uh, we, each time we sample a bunch of architecture and we will rank those architecture based on their trainability and expressiveness as a relative ranking within the same batch. And we're just adding their ranking index as a reward, which proved to be more stable. And eventually we just, uh, we also find those two, after you convert both of them into the relative rank, you don't, we don't even tune a lot about their linear coefficient. We just use a one versus one rank summation as a loss, uh, nice loss or reward. And further, we have incorporated a pruning-based approach to quickly shrink the search space so it could further make our search cheaper. So I didn't, I, I, I perhaps don't have time to go very deep into how this pruning is done, but the main idea is we are trying to, we use a NAS engineering trick called a SuperNet to compose all the operators in the search space into one really big neural network. And then from that really big neural network, we will remove each operator from its current position and then measure the change of the architecture the, the, of the trainability and the expressiveness before and after that a specific operator is being removed. So if uh, removing that or not does not cause a lot of difference in those two metrics, we will consider that operator in that specific location to be unimportant for the current architecture search and directly do not consider that in the sampling process. So with that post processing, we are able to reduce a, a large number, I think 70 to 80% of the candidate architectures even before the formal evaluation and the search loop has started. So that's an engineering trick, but the, that actually borrows ideas from uh, uh, the kind of work of pruning at initialization, like a SNP, graphs of and same flow. We learn ideas from those methods. Okay, so with uh, this practical framework, uh, we are able to look at uh, how those different two indicators uh, differ in their behaviors uh, and how they lead to the uh, practical search process. So first, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, those two metrics uh, seem to have uh, different preferences about what to choose. For example, when compared with their choose preference on a simple benchmark, uh, we find that uh, the network uh, trainability metric, uh, this conditional NDK, uh, NDK conditional number, seem to have a great preference uh, to select a lot of skip connections, uh, which is uh, friendly for gradient propagation, but not that friendly about the representativeness. It's a uh, wide extreme, right? And uh, the the network expressiveness uh, seem to like to choose a lot of fine-grained convolution, especially convolutional one times one, because they are better at uh, express um, express more nonlinear functions at fine scales. But those also create bottlenecks in fact propagating gradient. So eventually, if you add them to, there are things that they will trade off together. It's not the one way the extremes are better. And as on the right side, we have observed how those two metrics will change. They will trade off further during this search process. So from this point, uh, for, uh, we, you can see several points here, indexed from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that uh, indicates their relative uh, uh, occurring time during a search process. Zero means that the training is a search starting point, and then to search for a while, this is point one, and then two, three, four, until six. And the y-axis is the NDK conditional number. If you still remember, a lower conditional number means a better trainability. The x-axis is the number of linear regions. If you still remember, the, the larger number of linear regions means more expressive. So our ideal case we want is a network that is more expressive towards the right, and more trainable towards the bottom. So that would be ideal. So let's look at how a practical NAS algorithm trade-off between them. 
So in the first, uh, we will randomly start uh, random pick architecture in the search space, which uh, because of the search space is, is, is very large and have many useless architecture. Our starting point here is a uh, very intrainable as indicated by a large condition number. And the last algorithm finger out the trainable is, trainability is essential. So it will quickly aggressively reduce the trainability based on uh, well, uh, reduce the condition number, increasing the trainability by repeated sampling. So you will see there is a very quick and aggressive drop in the first stage of the NAS to make the trainability better and better. So, and after the trainability has dropped to a certain stage, now it cannot, it cannot keep dropping too much because if you drop further, as you will see, if you drop this further, our number of linear regions will get small. So it will convert this search space, search to the from stage one, aggressively dropping uh, dropping conditional number to a search two stage, which this search start to more delicately be between the gain of trainability and the loss of the expressiveness. Eventually, you are seeing that this search algorithm is weighing between a small range of the linear regions and the trade off of what's the best combination I can have by reducing NTK conditional number and also preserving the number of linear regions not drop too much. And eventually, we land with the point six, which seems to be a sweet point picked by this current search algorithm. And uh, I would also like to comment that this search behavior seems to be uh, quite uh, general, generally observed by current search algorithms. That may reflect a current design artifact or design deficiency of the search space. The search space may have contained a lot of not so trainable architectures, which the NAS algorithm finger out they are not permitting. So I'd better first rule them all out in the search space, don't waste my time. So we will first have this exploration stage to rule out those apparently not promising architectures by ruling out the, uh, by, by, by look at the trainability. In this stage, apparently trainability is the main criteria. And then it will become what we call a NAS exploitation stage, where it will more delicately trade off between trainability and expressiveness. So that's something we have observed from the different training algorithm on current search spaces. Uh, let me proceed to the result. So the result side basically, uh, well, not too much to say. We definitely get some okay result, or we will be rejected. So, the, well, the, the the publication dilemma, right? So, on the Cifatin, uh, the, so on the NAS benchmark, uh, as you can see, we're able to achieve a better test accuracy than all the pre almost all the previous search algorithms uh, while using surprisingly small search, search cost. This is measured on GPU second on uh, t uh, just the 2080 Ti uh, NVIDIA GPU. You will notice that there is another lightweight search baseline called NAS without the training, and we also compiled here. So it's uh, extremely cheap and quick to search because they use uh, very cheap indicators compared to our NDK and the linear regions. But I, I would invite you to check their paper for details, but it turns out that their very cheap indicators are not uh, as uh, uh, so use well not as uh, meaningful as our indicator use here. So the gap here are roughly between four percent and five percent, which is large for a NAS algorithm. And when we proceed to more open-ended search problems on CIFAR 10 and the ImageNet settings, we can uh, we observe that our NAS algorithm is much faster. So this is a T we call our algorithm TE NAS is much faster than the previous NAS methods in order of magnitude, as indicated by the search cost GPU days, while still achieving comparable or even better performance. So we uh on, on, well, if you, you want to get an idea how fast it becomes, the NASNet uh, paper, Google's original NAS paper published in 2017, how to search architecture of test accuracy 2.65 use 2000 GPU days. And in comparison, we are achieving even slightly lower test error using this many GPU days, which are minutes to hours, significantly reduce the cost, but not compromising accuracy. Compared to the PR method, there is a PR method that could achieve a significant, well, uh, quite uh, a visibly lower accuracy as called proxy NAS published by MIT in iClear 2019. So this is a lower accuracy, but the GPU cost is magnitude higher. And for other method, all other methods with even close GPU search cost, their accuracy, uh, I think we, we, we maintain solid accuracy and the number of parameters uh, number of parameters comparable to the lightest alternatives. And uh, this benefit 
uh, seem to be quite persistent uh, when you extend from ImageNet, especially compared to, uh, uh, we, we can directly search on the ImageNet search space without using any other surrogate data set. And that would only take uh, point the, 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 uh, uh, only take four GPU hours, this many GPU days. And that actually become a title we call a method uh, searching on uh, new architecture search on ImageNet with uh, four GPU hours. And I think uh, we kind of make uh, a record for doing that. So uh, uh, there is a nice visualization made by my student uh, who showed that uh, how the NAS search cost and the total accuracy has been progressing. So the search cost are going magnitude lower and lower, the top accuracy going higher and higher, and we are in a favorable position with the lowest search accuracy and one of the highest search, uh, lowest search cost and one of the highest search accuracy. So I do have a few more materials, but uh, Boris, do I have to shut up by myself for question or no waste the next speaker's time? Um, we probably shouldn't run too much over just because people are scheduled and I don't know when they're going to call in exactly and what their constraints are. So maybe I, I suggest that we can thank you and then people can ask you questions offline, you know, by private chat or, or, or whatever. Thank you. Yeah, I do have a, a few more pages uh, talking about uh, how we could gain more interpretability metrics uh, from NAS. So one way, one good thing from that is that because now we have three separate disentangled dimensions to evaluate architecture rather than just a black box accuracy, we can actually look at how those metrics uh, trade off each other during the search process. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to email us if you want to know more. And we have that all the code released. Uh, one of our papers are published at Clear and the one I've extended versions, uh, I promise that we will release to archive within the next week from today. So you're welcome to check uh, which will include the most result. Uh, we, are, uh, we, are, uh, we are including in this uh, talk. And that should uh, have concluded what I want to say today. Okay, well, thank you very much, Atlas. Let's everybody thank him. Um, you know, I, I think automated architecture search is super interesting, honestly. Um, so, so thanks for sharing that. Um, so, so please direct questions to Atlas offline, but I think Daniel is here. All right. so thank you, Barry. thank you. Yeah, if you can share your screen when you get a moment. Sure, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Oh, awesome. So hi, uh, nice to meet you guys. Let me just figure out how to share my screen. Let me just very briefly introduce you, Daniel, assuming you don't terribly mind. Oh, sure, yeah. Go and assuming that your uh, web page is more or less up to date. <laughs> um, okay, so, so our second speaker is Daniel Park. Daniel is a research scientist at Google Brain. And I, I've learned uh, a ton from him about, you know, what the problems are people actually face in practice and how many of the problems I study are useless from that point of view. Okay, so that's always a good reality check to get. Uh, Daniel got his PhD in theoretical physics from MIT, I want to say 2012. Is that right, Daniel? Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, so like, like many excellent physicists, he moved over to studying non-naturally occurring complex systems. Uh, so, 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 so there's that. And okay, it's a great pleasure to have you, Daniel. Please, uh, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Boris. Yeah, it's uh, super exciting to talk here. Uh, uh, Boris is a good friend and uh, I've always... Uh, Enjoy talking to him a lot. Uh, been a great inspiration for a lot of work, uh, and uh, super happy to be here with uh, students. <laughs> uh, cool. So uh, today I'm going to talk about um, practical problems in deep learning that perhaps theorists can help answer. Uh, um, like I, I really enjoy talking to Boris, uh, and uh, we just have like off the chats on things I find interesting and. Uh, things I wish like uh, smarter people can give me an answer to. Uh, so this is kind of an, ex an extension of that. Um, I just collected some natural problems I had from just uh, while I'm working, uh, I sometimes think, hey, like, it, it better if, like I can understand this better. So I collected some um, topics like that and hopefully they can inspire you for uh, new research directions. Um, and that's kind of the goal, uh, yeah. So let me see if this works. Are, are my slides uh, working? Do, do you see them moving around? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah. So machine learning is uh, first and foremost uh, an experimental, experiment-driven field, and uh, practical impact is a crucial factor in successful research. Um, 
So this will be an informal talk where I review some examples of theoretically motivated work that have made a practical impact. So that part would be very short because uh, I wanna go to the problems uh, and also ramble on a bit about some interesting problems that I think uh, theorists can help address, or I mean, even just hope theorists can help address or maybe inspire for new uh, research directions. Yeah, so the goal of this talk will be to give a taste of what somebody who's close to the practical side of machine learning is interested in and to stimulate a more theory oriented crowd with such problems. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've been working on semi supervised learning with uh, large models lately, and the problems I'll be putting forth arose mainly in this context. Um, given the limited amount of time, I'll be neglecting a lot of interesting subjects and important, uh, perhaps even seminal work that might be relevant. So I won't be, this, just a disclaimer that uh, don't be mad at me if I don't cite your work. Uh, <laughs> it's just out of ignorance and lack of time. Uh, so uh, this talk is based mostly on uh, work up, done by others, but some work of mine, uh, but also some work of mine with my collaborators. Uh, here are the uh, my, my friends that have uh, helped me on the work uh, that I'll be uh, vaguely citing. Uh, but this will mostly about, um, you know, very speculative informal. So please uh, interrupt me uh, often. Uh, if we go over time, uh, I'll, Boris can probably uh, post my uh, slide somewhere. Okay, so let me go over some um, success stories that I'm aware of, uh, where some theoretically inspired work made a really big impact. So here are like two examples uh, that, that uh, you know, I've been using, and these aren't like the two most famous or uh, most uh, widely known or whatever. Uh, th these are two that are kind of like, I kind of understand well enough to talk about. So uh, one direction uh, theory inspired work uh, hugely impacted um, like uh, practice, uh, like actual, um, um, you know, practical tasks is in uh, uh, with respect to large batch training. So in 2017, a uh, host of works appeared that found that uh, that found that the generalization performance of neural networks trained by SGD is determined by the ratio uh, learning rate divided by batch size. So uh, here's an image from one of my papers that uh, you know my like uh, my my paper isn't the original work that did this, but we kind of. Uh, have a nice uh, figure verifying this fact, so I inserted it. Uh, so on the left, um, we have a plot of test accuracy on MNIST um, on a three-layer uh, uh, fully connected network, where we've trained uh, you know the, this network with different learning rates uh, and different batch sizes. So so the x-axis is one over batch size. And all the different colors in the curves are, uh, you know, uh, have have a different learning rate. So, so you see, you um, so you see uh, for batch sizes, different learning rate give you the best performance and so forth. Now, if you merge all these graphs uh, such that the x-axis is the learning rate divided by the batch size, we have like some unspecified uh, overall constant factor multiplied here, but you can ignore that. So, so the x-axis on the second plot is the learning divided by the batch size. And you see that like all these curves uh, essentially pile on top of each other uh, in terms of uh, their, their uh, exhibited test accuracy. So this, uh, so uh, obviously, the, uh, so this result was used to shorten the training time on large data sets uh, by very large batch sizes in Smith and Kindermans et al. So, what they did was um, uh, they, they trained, uh, took, took a standard image uh, training um, schedule and then made the batch size very big, uh, shrunk the schedule uh, proportionally to the, well, inverse proportionally to the batch size and scaled the learning rate according to the rule. And they were able to train um, like, do, do image net training in 30, like essentially shorten like a very long uh, training time into like 30 minutes. 
So the, so the scaling principle provided a simple rule on how to scale the learning rate size and schedule when the batch size is increased. So another class of theoretical works uh, that have a big impact for practitioners is the study of uh, information propagation uh, in neural networks at initializations. Uh, sorry, at initialization. So we have lots of experts on this subject as speakers in the school, including uh, Boris, obviously, and uh, Jeffrey Pennington and other people. Uh, so I, I won't talk about this a lot. Um, I, I think a lot of uh, uh, the lectures are based on uh, uh, initialization conditions and such. So I won't talk much longer, but these studies to the practitioner provides a useful rule on how to initialize and bias parameters of deep networks, uh, given the nonlinearity uh, being used in the network. So uh, to me, the common theme of these two examples is that they provided uh, robust guidelines for good hyperparameters. So in both examples, uh, there were empirical rules that functionally worked in a given context. For example, there were things like Xavier initialization that people already were using. Uh, but these works uh, provided uh, rules that had a theoretical basis whose context of applicability was clarified by the theoretical analysis. So they gave you like some robust rule that you can kind of trust and apply to, to your particular setting and you expect, you expect it to kind of work and, and it did. So any questions up to this point? All right, uh, so, um, so, so the, sure. Sorry, um, in the very first plot that you showed, where we had different learning rates, the left figure, uh, yeah. were the, all the models were trained into same loss or trained up, up to same number of epochs or same number of updates because yeah, it so, uh, really matter. That's right. So uh, this paper, like if you look at this paper, we have like extensive, uh, um, uh, we, we, we explained this extensively. Uh, we essentially <laughs> train it until like for very long. Um, uh, so, so this is really the asymptotic behavior rather than the peak beat, sorry, asymptotic performance rather than the peak performance. Um, okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. So we have like at minimum some number of epochs and then, yeah, we just make sure we train it for very, very long. Okay, so given this common theme uh, for the rest of this presentation, uh, I'll talk about various examples where I had to find like uh, hyperparameters in an unsatisfactory fashion, you know, a small random search or an extensive grid search, et cetera, and wish that someone smarter would tell me which parameter to use. Uh, but uh, we'll make some, uh, hopefully it'd be uh, interesting to you. All right. All right. Um, so, so since this is a school, I should mention uh, the problem of tuning the learning rate and learning rate schedule. So this is a universal um, problem everybody has. And actually there is already a lot of work that addresses this problem. So it's not really a lot novelty to mention it, but um, I think that is worth mentioning. So um, finding a good learning rate and learning rate schedule is a universal problem in any project that requires training a neural network. So if you uh, don't, haven't tried different schedules or uh, tuned your learning rate, uh, probably uh, you can make your world a lot better by just doing those two things. So cho choosing a learning rate schedule is an always, it's, it's always an ad hoc procedure. Uh, everybody has their favorite way of finding their best learning rate um, and doing some kind of, uh, sorry, learning rate schedule. So like for every different, um, <laughs> task I have, so I've trained like lots of different tasks and everybody has their favorite schedule uh, for their favorite architecture and favorite setup. So um, uh, I, I've never seen like some universal good rule, like even for the same task, depending on the architecture, people use different schedules. And I never know if the schedule is really the best schedule for that architecture, or it's some local minimum where people use this schedule and optimize it enough that it works well for this baseline. So for all these different uh, architectures and um, tasks, like there, there's like some very ad hoc uh, procedure where you end up uh, with some learning rate schedule. And doing some kind of learning rate tuning is all, always required. So if you didn't do learning rate tuning for your uh, project, um, 
you're always going to get some gain from to learning right the right way, right way. So um, these two things, you know, if if you referee for for a conference or if you scan uh, the archive, you'll always find uh, new papers um, that have some theoretical basis of finding a better learning rate or a learning rate schedule. These are very important things that everybody has to deal with. Okay, so more into my personal interests. So a big trend in machine learning is to use large data sets to condition networks. So nowadays for many practical purposes, uh, Neural networks are not trained from scratch anymore. If you go to something like um, uh, Papers with Code and look at uh, the state of the art numbers for many uh, tasks, you know, say ImageNet, LibreSpeech, whatever, the state of the art numbers uh, are not trained from scratch anymore. They always um, do a ton of pre training. So for example, for uh, NLP tasks, work is first trained on a large text corpus with a language model task or a mass language model task uh, before being fine-tuned on a downstream task. So I don't think NLP people <laughs> train, uh, if they have a task they're interested in, I, I don't think they uh, train from scratch anymore. So similar non-supervised learning techniques are used for speech, but enforce the representation level rather than the raw input label. So um, a contrastive loss is used to make this kind of training work. So please, please feel free to you know, just ask if, if any term or something doesn't make sense or you don't understand it. This is school, so just uh, What do you, you mean feel. by contrastive loss? Yeah, so, um, so what's happening for speech is, uh, so I, I should have really cited the authors for this. Um, uh, but uh, for, for speech, uh, people don't uh, use um, like a BERT-like or, or a, a mass language model-like loss for um, their, uh, on, on the raw data because the raw data is kind of too dense. So for example, the input for speech is a spectrogram and you can guess like what a, what a pixel in a spectrogram looks by looking at like neighborings. Uh, pixels. So what actually people do is they first uh, send this spectrogram through, say, like a ComsNet and get representations of that spectrogram, like some more condensed representation of the spectrogram, um, and then feed it into a network. And they try to apply like a mask language model on the representation of the spectrogram. Now, the problem is if you apply something like uh, BERT, Right. So, so mask language model means you, you essentially like zero out like certain portions of the input and then ask the model to guess that input, right? If you, if you use like a naive uh, mask language model loss on representation, your, your model starts cheating. What it actually does is it makes the representation trivial. For example, it makes all the representations just zero and then your model guesses the correct representation all the time, right? Could be zero, right? So, so to stop your model from cheating, uh, you uh, introduce a contrastive loss that says, okay, I masked out this part. Uh, and then I choose contrastive samples from the unmasked part and tell the model uh, make a prediction that, said, that, that makes uh, the prediction closer to the masked part and further from the contrastive examples. Does that make sense? So um, yeah, so this kind of loss is yeah used. Could you repeat the last like two sentences you said? Like the, there's, I get like you get into this, uh, the convnet net that you might use on the spectrogram puts it into this representation space. Yeah. And then uh, you're saying that applying mass language modeling on that representation space is like what you're ending up doing, but you have to, could, could you explain again, like the, the contrastive part? I, I wasn't completely- Yeah, that's right. So, so what you say is, um, so you don't want the model to cheat. You, you understand that part, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what you want is, uh, so what you say is um, you wanna make the predicted uh, representation be close to the mask representation, right? But just requiring that uh, lets the model cheat 
So what you do is you sample contrastive representations from other frames and force the model such that the predicted representation is far from the contrastive samples. Does that make okay. sense? That, that makes yeah. sense. And yeah. in, in this case, the, the conf net that you use to put it into the represent, like uh, to like sort of embed into like the representation space, that right. is, uh, that I'm like the way that you're talking about this, it seems like that's like set. It's not maybe part of the training parameters. Oh, no, no, it's part of the training. That's right. Okay, because so you, you want like a good representation. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, that makes a lot of so, sense. So that's why it cheats, right? Because yeah, it yeah. wants to make like a good representation. But if you just train with like a naive uh, mass language model type loss, then, then it, it just course. cheats. Yeah. Of course, of course. Cool. Yeah, that, that was a good question. Yeah, it. Please just interrupt me because, like, yeah, this this is cool. We, we're we're all learning. Um, yeah, I'm learning so. Okay. Um, yeah. So so for images, um, consistency losses are widely used for pre-training. So so um, some deformation on an image is applied, and uh, the label for the deformed image is required to match the label for the uh, uh, raw image. Uh, so there are various names for this. Um, I won't get into it. Um, uh, so so um, what, one comment I have to make is uh, this doesn't really help with very large image tasks like ImageNet, as far as I understand. Um, it, it helps you know, for, for smaller tasks, but uh, less effective for large image tasks. So another popular method for uh, images is to pre-train a model with a very large label data set. So you would use, um, uh, you know, for example, you'd use ImageNet to prefer CIFAR and things like that. So I'll discuss uh, interesting issues related to this later. So uh, as an example, uh, to make my point, let, let's think about the, let's come back to the mass language model. A pre-training task that's been uh, re, uh, become popular lately is the mass language model task popularized by uh, uh, the BERT paper. So the mass language model task takes a sentence and then puts out a subset of tokens and then asks your model to guess which tokens were blocked out. So obviously there's a hyperparameter that's being used, right? So the number of b tokens being blocked out. So, uh, you know, obviously the BERT paper uh, does ablation studies with this and finds uh, a good um, uh, portion of the tokens you should be blocking out for a good result later on, right? But uh, it, it's not clear uh, what the optimal portion of block tokens should be for pre-training with respect to uh, downstream task performance, right? So the task be too easy or too hard. So if you're blocking out like too small amount of tokens, like you're learning something very trivial. And if you're blocking out way too much, then, then you're just essentially learning the distribution rather than learning something con contextual, right? So, so there, there's a happy middle ground, but what that middle ground is not clear, uh, especially because um, you don't know what the right hyperparameter is for, for the downstream task, right? So <clears throat> you're conditioning your model in a certain way but then uh, you have to further predict, oh, is this gonna be good for this model later on? You, you don't like see actual, it, it's different from something like tuning regularization or augmentation parameters, where again, right? There's, uh, you don't wanna regularize too hard, you don't wanna <laughs> regularize too little, but you're seeing the returns right away in that case. You have a training and test curve that you can see uh, instantly, Whereas for pre-training, it's not clear like what what it's not clear what to aim for, um, is what I'm saying. Uh, uh, hi, I have a question. Sure. So, what are the regulation parameters that you consider in the mass language models? Uh, are you regularizing so, so, the model itself, or are there? So, any... I'm not talking about regularization for the mass. In the in the case of the mass language model, I'm considering the parameter uh, that controls the, I shouldn't have said numbers of tokens, but the portion of tokens being blocked out, right? 
So for example, I can train uh, BERT with, by blocking out like just 1% of the tokens, or I can use 80% uh, of the tokens, right? To, to, to train BERT. Uh, in their paper, I think they use 10% and that, that's kind of the best number they find, but, but it's not clear, right? What, what the best number is before you go to the downstream task and fine tune BERT on, on the actual task you care about, for example, right? Say, say I care about, you know, like some, uh, uh, like some question answering problem. Um, I, I, I really don't know like what's gonna happen until I fine tune later on. Does that make sense? And is there a particular strategy of masking that works out well or is that also- another? So, so I, can't, I can't speak for the BERT people. In, in the instances I've used pre-training, it's very ad hoc. We just wing it. We, we just try a few. We just try a few parameters, uh, fine tune them later on and then take the best one. So, so that's why I'm um, putting this problem forth, right? Because uh, this is something people haven't studied that, that uh, systematically. And I think any perspective that adds to this is, is useful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so again, like most of the problems I put forth, they're really problems. I, I don't have a good answer. Um, uh, maybe a quick question on this. Yeah. Uh, it, to me, it sounds like it, it has to be like a very quite specific to the initial corpus as well as the final downstream task that you will be evaluating on. And there doesn't seem to be an universal uh, universal hyperparameter to set this portion of block tokens. Or are you actually expecting a spectrum or a telling at least well, to, for which task you should get which portion of the portion? Right. I, I think there, there should be a universal... Uh, well, I mean, not, not exactly, but there should be like, for example, when you're masking out portions, I think um, there should be some portion, for example, that, that, that does well universally for a wide range of downstream tasks. I don't think each downstream task would require like a very specific uh, upstream hyperparameter, but that, uh, because you're just learning a good rep. Like, okay, the, the better post question, do I have it here? Yeah, is when is my model pre-trained well, right? There should be some measure of understanding did, did my model pre-train well, right? <laughs> That's a vague notion, but still. Um, uh, so if you, if you believe there's some universality to um, all these downstream uh, uh, NLP tasks, which there seems to be, right? So BERT kind of, uh, the BERT paper was, um, made a big splash because it did show that there's, some universality to the downstream tests, right? Um, so if you believe that, I, I, uh, I, at least I believe, you know, th there is a notion of your model being pre-chained well. So, so uh, here's an example. If I have a labeled pre-training task or a language model task, right? Where I'm just predicting the next token in a sentence, there's a canonical answer. For example, the language model task, the law of perplexity per token is a universal thing. You can, it, it has like a, statistical meaning, right? So I think if I have two language models, one has a better log perplexity per token or log perplexity per word, I, I think you can safely say that's a better model, right? And if you view language model task as a pre-training task, like, you know, th there is a notion of one model being trained better than the other. It's this labeled pre-training, right? Like you see in a lot of image tasks, you take a much bigger image data set and train on there, you, you can just look at the uh, test performance of the upstream task, right? That we kind of agree that if the upstream task has better, say, validation accuracy, it should be viewed as being better trained. But a lot of these, say, contrastive loss, contrastive loss tasks, uh, uh, you know, and um, uh, 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 like uh, mass language model tests, there's no real notion of like, being pre-trained well, I, I, at least uh, you can't compare two, two things when they have like different pre-training uh, task definitions. So I, I think that's a very interesting problem. Okay, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, I have, I have time. ask yeah. something. Yeah, please. Pre this pre-training uh, uh, task is, uh, its purpose is to uh, create modules within your network that 
represent, uh, better represent the data uh, for another task? That's right. Just, you're, you're conditioning. I, I want to understand. Yeah. I want to understand the, the purpose of the... Uh, that's right, that, that's the idea. Uh, okay. Your model learns like some universal useful thing um, okay. by looking at unlabeled data, right? So, so like people learn. <laughs> so uh, looking at lots of, uh, you know, having a visual prior built into us rather like some, some combination of uh, genetics and um, learning, uh, we have some visual prior built in that helps us like do one shot learning, for example. That's a dog and you know what a dog is. So that's kind of the idea. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's go on to pseudo labeling. So large data sets are often pseudo labeled with a pre-existing model to be used to train another model. So this is, you know, referred to as self-training and lots of papers came out uh, regarding this, <laughs> not citing all of them. Uh, so uh, given that the amount of uh, unlabeled data is much larger than the amount of labeled data, an interesting question is to understand how to use, how to effectively utilize machine labeled data. So there are various measures to use to filter the pseudo labeled data. So let's think about image recognition, for example, and focus on the confidence of the prediction now. The confidence essentially is the, is the um, uh, soft maps value of your logic uh, on the correct, um, oh, sorry, on the predicted, uh, uh, on the predicted label. So it should be something like max, soft, soft max. For, for each label. So although this measure is not always available to us, that, that's a different question because there are different tasks uh, where uh, the loss you're actually using is never, um, doesn't really have an interpretation as a confidence, but, but uh, you know, let's not think about that for now. Okay, so even the model, when the model's well calibrated so that its confidence is well aligned with the accuracy of the prediction. So Training a well-calibrated model is a separate study. Let, let's not get into that, but even if you assume your model's well-calibrated in, in the sense I just described, it's not clear what subset of the data should be used to train a new model. Um, so, so, so let me explain. Um, so, oh, let, let me explain. So say I uh, pseudo label, you know, a, a giant unlabeled data set um, with an existing model. Um, it's not clear where to cut off um, in terms of confidence, uh, you know, uh, to, to where, where to cut off in terms of confidence to, to, uh, make a, uh, make a good, uh, training set for, for my, uh, student model. So, so let, let, let's get into this, right? So, uh, I, I'm not sure if there is a principle that determines which portion of the data should be used to uh, train a new model. So, uh, it, also, like it's not clear to me, like uh, whether this is a model-dependent problem, uh, whether like the student model matters or the teacher model matters, uh, etc. It's it's not super clear to me uh, whether different uh, filtering criteria should be used for different models. Um, so, so, can I interject for a second, Daniel? I have a question sure. for you. Yeah. So, so yeah. Just about the setup of this problem. Yeah. What do you assume that you have access to? just the predictions of a pre-trained model or also maybe the inner workings of it you know intermediate representations for the yeah, let, let's say we have everything i, I, I don't care let, let's say we have everything about the models on both but say the the um the uh real labels of the unlabeled data are not accessible to 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 both of the models okay but accessible to us the oracle but but not not uh, not the actual models. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. And and then we have and then we have like a baby task. Uh, that sorry, a, a smaller set that we have access uh, of the labels to. That, that's the setting. So so uh, just to uh, just to um, go to the spherical cow. Let, let's assume an infinite amount of unlabeled data. Right. Let's say the unlabeled data infinite. 
So naively, you might think, hey, let, let's uh, cut off the confidence at something like 98%. Like, just get the super confident, um, super confident uh, uh, um, samples of the unlabeled data set that, that my teacher is, 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 you know, super confident about, right? So, so what's the problem with that, right? Because since I have an infinite amount of data, even if I throw at 99% confidence, I still have an infinite amount of data. But the problem is the, the teacher model has its own biases. So the sample you generate for the student model might be biased, right? So the teacher may be super confident about cars, but never confident about birds. So you just get a ton of car images and, and not a lot of bird images and your student model gets affected by that. So, so you can have scenarios like this, uh, not, not this simple, but obviously uh, it, I don't think it's a trivial problem. And uh, as far as I can tell from the papers written, including pa papers I've written, uh, what we use to cut things off is like super ad hoc. Uh, we just like pick a number and uh, use that to filter. In my experience, I, I just pick a few different numbers, try it out, uh, use the best one. Uh, but, but this is very unsystematic. Uh, I have a question. Uh, sure. Why don't we put, uh, give all the data, all unlabeled data to, the, to train the student model? Uh, like why, why do we need a hyperparameter to cut off uh, the confidence? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, that, that's a good uh, question. So if you give all the unlabeled data, uh, the low confidence ones are probably garbage. So uh, your, your student model will be getting a lot of mislabeled data, right? Um, and it won't train right. Uh, is, isn't so, there a, some sort of self-tuning that helps you there? Like you keep on, uh, so even if it's a low confidence score, your model keeps on tuning itself uh, on the low uh, confidence data. Like it can change the label. Uh, it can also change the true label if it wants, even if it's strong. I see. You're saying you give it like soft labels or something. Like yeah. That, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that, that's an interesting thought. Um, I don't think it, I don't think that works well in practice. Uh, I might be wrong. Somebody correct me if I am. Um, I haven't been successful with that. So if I give like a model, uh, a crappy prediction with just low confidence, um, I I think there are examples where, where that can help. Uh, I, I haven't been successful with that. <laughs> in my experience but maybe uh that's limited but that that's certainly interesting um but because. but um but but uh but all right here's what i say uh there's a lot of garbage label with high confidence as well so um i i don't think using soft labels is uh like um gets rid of this problem actually uh because we may want the model to learn the hyperparameter itself Maybe, you but when know. you say hyperparameter, what does that mean? Oh, that number, the score, like uh, where you cut off on the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, right? that, that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, that's an interesting uh, because point. It but but I, I, I guess the problem is um, you don't necessarily want your model to um, replicate the performance of the teacher. So, 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 okay, let's do this. Say I have an infinite set, right? And I do what you tell me to do. Just use soft labels of the teacher and the student, right? Yeah. So in that case, what I think will happen is the teacher and student model will just have the exact same performance. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. You don't want that. <laughs> okay. okay. Maybe some other That's... clever way might work. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I'm asking for other clever ways. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so um, yeah, uh, so uh, let's go to the enchilada, uh, scaling up model size. And this is kind of uh, where, where uh, like uh, all of this kind of culminates in my mind. So a lot of the problems discussed so far can be addressed in a brute force manner when dealing with small models. I think with a tiny model, like layer network, you can just do this uh, and just brute force everything I, I talked about, um, uh, no big deal. Um, but often what happens is that a given method or hyperparameter is found for a smaller model and scaled up to a big
big model kind of using ad hoc rules. So sometimes people find some good method or good hyperparameters here. And then when they scale up, they have their own like secret rules. Or what happens is, oh, I decide to fix some of these hyperparameters and some I, I, I retune for the big model. So the big question is how to extend a result obtained in a smaller network to a bigger one. And this is kind of a, a big question. Uh, uh, we've talked about architecture search before. I think it's a theme in architecture search as well. Uh, so, so realization method, you know, pre-training hyperparameters, training hyperparameters, all this stuff. Uh, it's all, um, you know, I, th I think like, you know, for you can always take a smaller version of the model and brute force this and get something good, but it, it's it's very uh, it's unclear how to um, extend this to 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 like an actual model you'd use in practice or, or something bigger. Okay, so an interesting roadblock for this is that there seems to be a non-trivial relationship between model architecture and data. Um, so, so what I'm saying is like that the path of making your model bigger and scaling other stuff together, like there seems to be like a, like a turning point in terms of model scale where things like quantitative, like qualitatively change. So there are clear indications that larger models uh, perform better when the data set's very, very large, but so that only a few epochs can be trained practically. Things get murky when the data set size is smaller. So, so the large regime, I have a couple papers that have uh, some good results talking about why larger models are always better. So for example, CNNs seem to show monotonically better performance on ImageNet with increasing data set size. Sorry, uh, I should say, I, I'm sorry, this is wrong. Um, I should say increasing model size. Uh, let me fix that later. While the model performance seems to get worse after some critical size for attention-based models. So, so let me, uh, allow me to uh, go to someone else's paper. So this is by uh, Mingxing and Kwok. Uh, this is the famous EfficientNet paper where they have this, um, you see this tab, right? The, so, yes. so they have these um, uh, uh, plot kind of uh, ImageNet top one accuracy against the number of parameters here. And at least in the range of things they've seen, like these family of models kind of always seem to improve performance with uh, increasing size. But uh, if you look at this other paper, uh, let me right here, a famous uh, vision tremor paper. Um, if you look here in this figure, uh, it seems like as your model, so, so from what I understand, this VITB is smaller than VITL. Uh, the performance of VITL on ImageNet is worse than VITB when they're not pre-trained. So, so here's the interesting thing uh, that I'm going to get to later. When you pre-train these models on some uh, labeled data set, big labeled data set, it, it actually uh, realigns the right way. So bigger models get better later when you pre-train them. But when you train them from scratch, right, there, there seems to be like some uh, optimal size where, where things get worse after that size. So similar decrease in performance has been observed for attention-based speech models. So, so let me get into that. Uh, so, so like as an aside again, uh, I have to note that this trend gets flipped back to normal uh, when the models are pre-trained. So, so this is uh, one of uh, uh, my papers with uh, Yu Zhang and James Chin. And um, we have this uh, word error rate, uh, bigger is worse is better, since it's an error rate of a uh, test called liver speech. Uh, with increasing model size, actually these uh, word error rates go up if you go from 100 million parameters to a billion parameters. But if you pre-chain them, uh, uh, they, they kind of uh, follow like the usual trend of larger models being better. So I think this is an interesting phenomenon, like not, not a lot of theorists have noticed the rest yet. So, so I think that's useful to point out. Anyways, um, so, so I think uh, the biggest problem that, that I wanna put forth is what 
does scaling up mean? What, what does making the model big? So first useful step in understanding all these problems should come from understanding what scaling up means. So as shown in the efficient network, um, they show uh, how to construct a family of models with increasing size makes a difference with respect to model performance. So to summarize what they did, they, um, they uh, experimented with different ways of making your model bigger in terms of uh, making it deeper and wider and increasing um, uh, resolution. They, they, they found different ways of scaling your, your model and found some optimal way that optimizes performance. So when you say scaling up, it, it, it's not even uh, a well-defined term since, since there's a, there are many different ways of making models big and they, they matter. So, so I think it's useful to think about what scaling up means and how different scaling behaviors affect the model. So another interesting thing I wanna point out is that there's evidence that particulars of scale, scaling depth and width don't matter for giant transformer language models trained on extremely large data sets in contrast to the efficient net story. Um, so essentially just like the number of parameters seem to matter uh, in this context. But I think it's very interesting, like how different scaling behaviors affect different models in different contexts. Also, one thing I, sure. Sure. Hi, can I ask a question about uh, if there's any, um, like, I don't know, folklore or folk theorems about uh, what kinds of scaling up um, are efficient and which ones are not, or if yeah. it's really kind of wide yeah. open? I think I think it's wide open just because, for example, you know the the various efficient net studies and what these uh, giant transformer language model studies say very different things, right? Um, so I, I don't think there's a set. Um, also, these experiments are very expensive. I I think once once you want to go to the very big model limit, so they're not carried out that often, just for uh, studying trends' sake, right? Um, so I think this is an underexplored problem. But uh, the, the question I want to put forth is, is there a particular scaling rule that is more an, amenable for theoretical analysis? For example, the infinite width limit, right, is a scaling limit to, to make a large model variation. I think that's, uh, that's been a very fruitful regime. Um, so for a particular family of scaled up models, can we make some useful predictions about transferring hyperparameters in the size limit? Uh, how big is big enough for this work, right? Like, what, like uh, when you say large limit in the scaling limit, like wh where does that start? For example, if the relevant regime for the scaling limit is too big for practical use, like it's kind of useless for a practitioner. So I think th these are all very, very interesting problems. So I think I'm out of time. Um, so I've gone so over some problems I've entered in my research um, that I think a theoretical perspective would be useful on. And hopefully this uh, sparks some ideas that can culminate in uh, research projects that can help us all. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much, Daniel. That was a very interesting talk. Um, yeah, for, for sure. So, so we're, we're sort of on a tight schedule. So let me just right. suggest that people take questions offline with Daniel. You know, maybe you guys can chat or, you know, exchange emails or, you know, there's also the gather town link that you all can use and talk in that pseudo strange way. Um, but, but so thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, I think Mark Aurelio is here already. Oh, I don't see. Only Hi, see everybody. Him. Hey, Mark Aurelio. Uh, let me share my screen. Let's see this one. Uh, uh, just a second. Can you see? Yeah, that's great. Let, let me very briefly introduce you. Thank you. So far as, as I am capable. Um, so, so um, Mark Aurelio, uh, so for, let me say, Mark Aurelio is someone I met when I was briefly visiting Facebook AI, but as his slide says, he's moving to DeepMind, so that's very exciting. Um, so so I, I guess if I'm not wrong, um, in about 2009, you got your PhD from NYU. I was projecting from your start date. Your end date doesn't seem to be on your website. Um, studying with Jan LeCun. And he then, you know, was one of the founding members of Facebook AI Research and now is at DeepMind. And when I was at FAIR, 
I had a, some very interesting conversations with Mark Aurelio where he blew my mind about how people actually do certain machine translation tasks and things. I don't think that's quite what he's going to talk about, but I'm really excited because I, I bet this is going to be very interesting. So, so thanks very much for being here, Mark Aurelio. And thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Boris and all our organizers for having me today. And thank you for uh, joining this presentation. I'm going to talk about learning from non-stationary uh, data sets. And this is work that I've done a fair. Um, and if we don't get to your question during this talk, feel free to email me to my personal email address. I'd be happy to follow up with you. So before uh, we dive into the details, let me state what uh, I'm interested in here. So the goal of this research is to do efficient learning. And by efficient, I mean both statistical and computational efficiency. So statistical efficiency is about learning with few uh, data samples, tra training samples. And uh, typically, we think about uh, label training data, but I'm thinking, you know, even when you do self-supervised learning, usually you train on billions of unlabeled data. And I would like to be able to learn with fewer training examples, even if these are unlabeled. Even more so if these are labeled, but it's about how many training examples you need to, to train uh, um, your model. And uh, the second um, aspect of efficiency pertains to computation efficiency. And this is about how much computation you need to process a single uh, example, both at training and test time. And so with that in mind, uh, let me tell you uh, how to get that, right? So there are many different ways to uh, build an efficient model. And here I'm focusing only on two uh, uh, ways to get there. So the first one is to leverage the fact that data sets are not static. And so if you have uh, if you want to train a model on a certain task, it is often the case that in the past, you have seen some other tasks that relate somehow to the task that you want to solve. And so in, in a way you can build a data-driven prior that can make your model possibly most, more statistically efficient and more computation efficient. Let me give you a, a simple uh, example of this. So I just moved to London and here, as you may have heard, people drive on, on the left side of the, of the road, and now I need to, to uh, get my driving license, right? And so if I didn't drive before, this would take me several months. But because I've driven before, although on the other side of the road, I hope it will take me only a few hours. I will tell you in a little bit if it is true, but that's, that's the same idea also for, uh, for the learning machine. I would like to be able to transfer knowledge from a task to uh, another one. Um, and of course, there are a lot of open questions when we do this. So the first one is how to formalize learning from a non-stationary stream of data. And uh, uh, as you learn from a sequence of uh, tasks, how do you retain plasticity? How do you make sure that you can still learn a new thing uh, over time? And uh, at the same time, as you learn more and more things, how do you make sure that there is no interference with other unrelated tasks? And fundamentally, there is the question of what is knowledge? And how do you represent knowledge? Is knowledge in the parameters of the model? Is knowledge in the algorithm that the model is um, executing? Is knowledge in some sort of rules that, uh, that the model is operating with. And so uh, how do we operate in the space of knowledge? And, um, and then from the optimization side, there is also the question of what does it mean to generalize and to optimize? Oftentimes you start from a model that, that has been pre-trained on some other tasks, right? And it has been, uh, it has well converged. And now we start uh, from that point. And so how, um, how does optimization work in that setting? So we talked about data-driven priors, the fact that data sets are not static and we build a prior that is data dependent. The second tool that I'm going to focus on this presentation, presentation is compositionality. And uh, the instantiation of this in terms of neural nets is via modularity. 
Let me give you an example here. Uh, this is uh, a robotic application and it is a playing soccer is a very uh, complex task. And on the right hand side, you can see that um, uh, we can define a, a bunch of subtasks that can be used to solve this very complicated task. And each of these subtasks can be further decomposed into sub subtasks, right? And you can you could imagine that if we improve uh, our ability to solve one of these subtasks, we can improve the overall system uh, performance. And so uh, here I'm very much speculating, and my, my speculation is that if we build an architecture that has uh, a modular inductive bias that in a way reflects this, uh, the compositionality of the task, we may be able to be more uh, sample efficient and, uh, and also computation efficient. And so by this, I mean that in this case, we have a three layer neural net where each layer is, is um, composed by two modules. And so every task is gonna be a path through this sequence of modules. And so for this uh, um, uh, soccer game, we can have that, for instance, uh, playing soccer during the day, we'll go through this sequence of paths. And then if later on we need to play soccer at night, perhaps the only thing that we need to do is to replace the first layer module, right? The front end. And so this is gonna be very powerful because I don't need to relearn all parameters of the model, but just the parameters in the first layer block. And presumably that will allow me to learn more efficiently with less label data and with less computation. And perhaps if later on I have a similar task, I can reuse and recombine modules in a different way. Okay, so uh, again, there are a lot of open questions here. So what does it mean for a task to be compositional? Um, how do you formalize this notion? And then how to learn to decompose a task into subtasks. Uh, and, um, and in particular, when you instantiate in terms of a neural net, uh, how do you modularize, modularize computation? It could be that, I don't know, a big transformer uh, neural net. It could be that it, it is doing composition learning, particularly when you train on um, text data. But it could be that this modularization is implicit. It is doing compositional processing in an implicit way. Uh, and there could be an argument for making this explicit in the sense that if it was modular, then we could achieve better um, computation efficiency because now you have a, um, a sparse computation that is uh, in blocks. And so that's more amenable to efficient GPU processing, for instance. Um, and so then there is the question of what are good modular architectures and uh, how do we make this um, architecture grow over time so that you can uh, constantly learn new tasks. All right, so to summarize the goal, uh, the, the big idea here is to uh, learn in an efficient manner in terms of number of uh, training examples, in terms of compute and the two tools that we are going to focus on is uh, data-driven priors. So the fact that you get a bunch of tasks over time and uh, compositionality. Of course, there are many other things that um, you could uh, explore, but these are the two that I'm going to focus on today, okay? And uh, I'm going to talk about in the remaining 30 minutes or so about two papers um, uh, on this topic which are very much uh, looking at the same problem, but with two slightly different settings. So one where data arrives in chunks over time, but these chunks come from the same underlying distribution. So it is just the same task, except that data comes a little bit at a time. And in the second part of this presentation, I'm going instead to assume that the different chunks actually come from a different data distribution. So you really have different tasks at different times, okay? And tasks may relate in some unknown way. So Ning, do you have a question? His hand might've been left up on answer. Ah, okay. But, but actually I have a question, Mark. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so when you say that the data arrives in large mega batches, are you kind of saying we we see it once and then we don't have access to it later? 
Like what's the difference with like, I, I just can't store it or something like that. No, no. So I, I would say that you don't, so typically we assume that data comes to us all at once. It can be a large data set, but it comes all at once. Here I'm saying that data comes over time. You don't have access to future data, but you have access to all the past data. And now maybe I should go to the next slide. <laughs> so, uh, which is the, the answer to your question. So he, usually we assume that, uh, yes, data all, comes all at once. And then um, the time that it takes to process a mini patch is the same time that your data loader gives you data. In a way, the, the clocks of when data uh, arrives to you and, and, uh, and the time that it takes you to update the model parameters are in sync. But in many practical applications, actually these two things are off sync. So in particular, it takes much longer for data to arrive than for you to process data. Think about language modeling, right? So we, we can take a snapshot of common crawl now. So all the data that is in the internet, train a very large language model. Six months from now, it's around Christmas time. And you may want to get a new snapshot of common crawl with the recent statistics of you know, the data in order to do your, I don't know, um, text prediction model. And, and then the question, and, and you know, and then uh, over the six months, you could train your model, right? Or you could decide to wait to get even more data to train your model. And so uh, this is pretty much, and, but of course you can use all the, all the past data that you have. It will just cost you computation, okay? Um, so essentially we assume that uh, each stick, at each stick, we get a mega batch. A mega batch is composed by a lot of mini batches. The mini batch is what you feed to your model to train your parameters. We assume that the time that it takes you to update the model parameters is negligible compared to the interval between uh, the arrival time of two consecutive uh, mega batches. Okay, but uh, updating your model cost you in terms of plops. And so that will be taken into account when we look at computation. And, uh, and we assume that each data set comes from the same underlying distribution. So it is just one task is that the data comes over time, okay? Um, right, and so what we would like is, is a model that gives you a non-negligible prediction at any point in time that over time uh, decreases its error rate and it is efficient in terms of memory and compute. And so these are the defining properties of an anytime learning system. But here we are not looking at anytime learning at the level of each megabatch, but at the level of the whole stream of uh, megabatches, okay? And in particular, we do just one pass over this stream but you can do multiple passes over each mega batch. Of course, once you start doing multiple passes over each mega batch, then data is not really anymore IID at the level of the whole stream, right? And so, you know, you, you, the, the, you know the, the basic assumptions of empirical risk minimization don't quite apply. And so I'm going to give you a toy illustration of the dream. What before start before doing this this research, I was expecting this kind of results. And let me show you, you know, what I was expecting, and then I'll show you what I got, <laughs> which is somewhat similar but not quite. So you would imagine that if here on the x-axis we have time, and on the y-axis we have error rate, a very simple baseline is if you say um, I'm going to train on the current mega batch, a model initializing the parameters from the model train on the previous mega batch. So I'm constantly fine tuning and over each mega batch, I can do multiple passes and constantly fine tuning my model. And so you could imagine that over time, the error rate decreases and you have a start case because I'm assuming that the time to train the model is negligible. Okay? Another strategy, is to instead wait until you get a lot of mega patches. So let's say until T4, and then you train a much bigger model, okay? And this is presumably 
going to perform better, give you a lower error rate. However, if you're interested in any time learning, you want to have a good model at any point in time. And so really not, none of these two approaches is ideal because even the tardy uh, fine tuning model actually gave you a terrible performance for the longest time, although at the very end gave you the best performance. And so in order to assess uh, the model more holistically uh, through the whole uh, experience, we are going to measure not just the error rate at the end of the learning experience, but the area under this error rate curve, okay? And so this would be the area for the tardy uh, fine tuning model and this for the greedy fine tuning model. And in this case, perhaps the greedy is going to do better than the tardy, although the uh, latest error rate is not uh, as good. But, um, yes? I have a question about uh, the error rate that you are looking at. Because we're getting our data in time, what is, is like, I'm wondering if this is like a test error rate, like what is the error rate? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 good question. So I'm assuming that over time you got training data, but you have a test set that is common across all the megabatches so that you can uh, then compute this curve. So this curve is evaluated on, on a common test set. In practice, you, you don't even have that. In practice, you have a validation set and a test set for each megabatch. But here I'm assuming that we can evaluate on the common test set. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, us, for asking the question. Um, so now we have two extremes. I have two questions, sorry. Yep. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, could you uh, uh, take a quick moment to uh, specify why uh, uh, tardy fine tuning performs so much better than 3D oh. fine tuning at the very end? Yeah, yeah, because greedy fine tuning, you know, you define your architecture size and everything based on a small, relatively small data set here, right? While tardy fine tuning, you have access to a much larger data set, right? And so you can do all your cross validation and stuff on, you know, a much larger data set and presumably that can perform better. Not only here, even for the same uh, size of the model, here you do training on IID data, while the greedy fine tuning trains every time on the small mega, on relatively small mega batch that it gets. So here, yeah, you 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 know you shuffle your yeah. data and you yeah. But here you Thank see you. It. You. greedy, you see it sequentially. But these are the the two extremes of a spectrum, right? On on the one hand, you have greedy fine tuning that every time you see mega batch you train on it, and then on the other extreme you have tardy fine tuning where you wait until the very end in order to train. So you could also wait an intermediate time, let's say every two megabatches, like you see here on the, with the yellow curve. And perhaps you can strike a better trade off between time that you wait to get a useful predictor and error rate that you get at the end. And the second conjecture that I'm making is that, well, perhaps if we also grow capacity over time, we can do even better. We can strike an even better trade-off. Let's say that at this point here at T4, I actually increase the capacity of the yellow model. Perhaps I should be able to lower further, um, lower the error rate. And so this is these are the conjectures and the kind of models that I'm going to play with and, and report to you. And so a quick, we, quick question, Macarena, yes. while on this. Yes. So maybe I'm just missing something, but it seems like at the very least, whenever you see some data, you should make at least one pass over it. <laughs> is that is that true? Uh... Because like, you know, from, from somehow from the point of view of data you've never seen, it's still kind of totally IID. So now or later, I mean, it's the same. But you know, maybe there's some sort of subtlety. I'm not. I'm just trying to understand what a theoretical kind of lower bound is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it really depends on what is your metric. If your metric is the final error rate, then better for you to wait for everything to arrive, shuffle everything, and train. <laughs> I think if the metric is what I'm trying to uh, uh, recommend <laughs> right now, which is this area under the curve. I think you rather better use the data as it comes. Uh, but then uh, you may lose a little bit because you, you lose uh, the IID-ness. And so you may lose a little bit of that. 
And so it depends also on how efficient is your algorithm. Uh, and, you know, this is very much preliminary research. And so what we have been doing is simply pretty much fine tuning. And so we haven't been, uh, so I, I think it, depending on the learning algorithm, you may find that actually using the data as it arrives by doing something fancy in the fine tuning may be a good thing to do. That would be great. That's not what we see, but that would be great. Okay, thanks. Okay, so then we do the same thing, replacing error rate with memory and compute. And again, the lower uh, area under the curve, uh, the smaller area under the curve, the better, right? Um, so the setting is the following. You, we take a data set, a standard data set, and we split it into B disjoint mega batches. And then uh, we do a pass over the sequence of mega batches only once. Okay. But the model, once it receives a mega batch, can do whatever it wants with it. So it can perform multiple passes over it. It can wait to collect a few mega batches before training the parameters. It can extract a validation set to uh, cross validate its own hyperparameters. That's what uh, we do. And, uh, and then in terms of metrics, as I said, we are gonna measure error under the curve for error rate, memory, and compute, all right? So let me tell you a little bit about the models. Um, we have, uh, essentially we consider fixed size architectures where the backbone is a mix of experts. And so a mix of experts is a simple predictor where the predictor is a weather sum of experts, this function H of the input X, you have k of them here, and with a scalar that is uh, the j component of this g of x vector, uh, we consider multiple layers of this. And so we have a hierarchy of this mix of experts, and this is a natural choice because we want to grow the architecture, so it is natural to add experts over time, right? In particular, if you select only one expert, uh, uh, per each layer, then you can grow the number of parameters while keeping computation constant, which is very desirable. The problem with this is that it's very hard to train and it still doesn't work quite well. And so the way that we add experts, you cannot just add uh, simply an expert, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a naive way, because once you add an expert, the getting function has a partition function right over the other experts. So you're gonna mess up all the responsibilities of uh, the other experts. And so the way that we do it is by building a tree structure on the gating function. And so uh, let's say that you want to split uh, this uh, expert here at the bottom, you're gonna add another expert and all the examples that were assigned to that expert are now, are now going to be split initially at random between two child experts, okay? A right and a left children. And so uh, we can decide when to split and we do this based on validation loss or every and with updates. The way that we split is uh, simply by picking the expert that has the largest cumulative loss. So we record all the examples and the corresponding loss that go through this expert. We sum all the corresponding losses. And then if the cumulative loss of this expert is higher than this one, then we are gonna split this guy, okay? And then the way that uh, we initialize, we simply initialize uh, the experts of these two children by the, uh, by the parameters of the parent expert and the gating is at random. So really the, the, the growing uh, step is totally smooth and there are no jump in the loss. Um, in the paper, you find uh, a few data sets. Here, I'm going just to focus on NIST because it is easier to explain and the findings are very similar. So we take the MNIST training set, we split it into 100 mega batches. We have a three layer fully connected neural net. And uh, let me walk you over the results. Uh, I think uh, time is getting tight here. So, we start with um, a, a very small neural net with four hidden units, okay? So it is uh, 28 by 28 and then four, four, and then 10. And so 
uh, the, the blue is the fixed architecture. So it's a mix of experts that has only one expert per layer, doesn't grow, okay? So it's a tiny nine. So the blue line is what you get with tardy fine tuning when you wait until the very end and then you train your model on all the training set. The dotted line is what you get when you train, you do fine tuning after each mega batch. Okay, so it's very greedy. And then you had a dash line where you wait five mega batches, you, uh, you can concatenate the five data sets and then you train on these five data sets and then you go to the next five and so on and so forth. So, and then you have the red, the red is like the blue, except that here we grow, okay? And so uh, the red dash line is like the starts from the red blue line, but over time you grow the model size by adding experts as I described before. And so as you can see, uh, an intermediate um, update frequency works better than being uh, greedy and being tardy, except at the very end, but in terms of the area that works the best. And then uh, if you grow the architecture, you do better, right? Then keeping a fixed uh, uh, architecture. This is what you got in terms of memory versus time. Of course, the model grows, uh, grows linearly. Here it is log scale. So that's why it looks like a log. And also in terms of compute, okay? And so we summarize the whole thing with a radar plot. In this case, a little degenerate, but you will see it will make sense later, where we have cumulative error rate here. Um, so error under the curve for cumulative error rate, um, memory, compute, at uh, training test time, okay? So the, uh, the red is when you grow and the blue is when you don't. And so when you grow, you do better in terms of error rate, but worse in terms of memory and compute, of course. So that, that's, that's a little bit what I just described, right? And now we're going to grow the backbone, okay? So now we have four hidden units, we're gonna see eight and 32. And so the first thing that you observe is that as you make the model bigger, the error rate decreases as you would expect, right? Uh, not only um, the gap between the fixed size model and the model that grows gets smaller and smaller. So as you go from underfitting to overfitting, growing, uh, gives you marginal gains. And then, interestingly, if you look at the growing model with four hidden units, uh, uh, like uh, this uh, dashed red line here, and you look at the fixed model with 32 hidden units, the big model. So at this point, the memory consumption here and here are the same. So the model size is the same. And they achieve the same error rate here, right? So the final error rate of the tiny model that grew and the big model that starts is the same. So it means that the big model is more statistically efficient because here you have seen only one tenth of the whole training set. Well, here you have seen the whole training set. There is a, a caveat, which is that the bigger model that hasn't grown yet has a 32 dimensional hidden state. Well, this one has a four dimensional hidden state, but many more, as many parameters as the big model. So the size of the hidden state <laughs> is an important parameter, right? But the idea here is that, you know, even um, on a small data set and with fully connected nets, it seems that bigger models generalize better. And so to conclude this part, uh, anytime learning a macro scale is a pretty realistic learning setting. Um, it's, it's an interesting abstraction at least. And we got some promising results with growing architectures, although we got diminishing returns as we make the model bigger. But if you think about, and we, we, we found very much the same findings for large scale language modeling. The problem is that six months from now, CPUs will have more compute and more memory. And so even if you, if you train the largest possible model, you will still need to figure out a way to grow it eventually. And we still don't quite know how to do that. And so I think this is something interesting to consider. And of course, there are interesting questions for me and that I ask you, which is, you know, how to better train these modular networks and what are good architectures that are, uh, that are good for these purposes that are modular. 
and um, and better understanding this phenomena that bigger models generalize better, even on tiny data sets and, and fully connected nets. So that concludes this part. And I think I have about 10 minutes to go over the next, unless there are questions. I actually have a very quick question. I, I, I think in all the experiments you did, or maybe I missed when you were talking about it, you assume that ultimately over all the data, you only make one pass. That, that is you sample your mega batches kind of without replacement. That's right. Do, do you think it would be very different if you sampled them potentially with replacement? But in some limit, it has to be different because you'd start seeing data again and you know, you, and there'd be no reason to wait to see it again or something like that. Well, if you sample with replacement, then you're doing IID, right? You're back to the case where, like, if you do one pass over each megabatch and then you assemble with replacement, then it becomes really IID. No, but I'm saying do more than one pass over each megabatch. Ah, I see, I see, I see. But, but like, you know, eventually you've seen all of MNIST and like, it, it doesn't make sense to wait anymore, presumably, or, and maybe even doesn't make sense to grow anymore because somehow there's no more information to capture yeah. or something like that, right? Totally, totally, totally. I think that that would be an intermediate setting between fully IID and what I described. And I think uh, you, you will fall somewhere in between. And uh, in our experiments, we grow based on the validation set. So if you are not improving on the validation set, you don't grow. That was uh, so that's the second part of your question. Got it, thank you. Uh, also I also have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so there's this idea of ensemble averaging. Um, does this relate somehow to this, to like growing the model size? I actually couldn't catch what did you what averaging? The um, ensemble averaging. Do so you have a bunch oh, of yep. smaller networks and then you average over them instead of having one large one? And that's sometimes more effective, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're comparing the paper also to ensembling actually, and uh, we found that so if you train an independent net on each megabatch and then you you show the ensemble are one, two, three. Over time, you add um, components to your ensemble as you train on the different megabatches. You actually yeah. get a nice error rate that decreases, but it's not as good as if you were to grow over time as we uh, proposed. Okay. Now, I don't know how anecdotal this is, uh, so, but I think, I think definitely that's a strong baseline, right? That, that, that's, that, that's a something to consider, yeah. Okay, thanks. Like learning on the residual or, um, yeah. Also a high level question. So yeah. suppose in practice we have um, like maximum model size like above which we cannot uh, grow anymore. Um, and suppose we are currently at this threshold. So for future data, should we periodically print the model and then grow again? Or should we stick with the current model um, and basically never grows anymore. So from my experience, so I didn't try to prune. So I can tell you empirically, and also it probably depends how you prune. In my experience, like if I had to guess, I would say you don't need to prune, just keep the model as big as you can. A year from now, you will have more compute and more memory <laughs> and you can afford to have a bigger model. And then there is the question of, should you train from scratch or can you reuse what you have learned before? And particularly if I think about us getting closer to solve AI, right? We should be able to, to reuse what we have learned before, right? Um, so that's what I'm trying to do here. But uh, I, I would think to, to directly answer your question, I would, my guess is that you don't need to prove. Just training the largest that you can is good. But then in a little bit, you will have more computer, more memory at your disposal. Yes, makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, so uh, unless there are other questions, well, actually, we have eight minutes. Is that right? Uh, so maybe let me give you a quick. Uh, all right. So. 
So we have we have a different setting for continuous learning where each mega batch now comes from a different distribution. So each uh, so it's really a different task uh, that you observe over time. And in the literature, people haven't really explored how transfer learning happens in this scenario. And so we introduce a, a new a stream, a control setting, where we can measure uh, transfer, okay? And so for instance, we have a sequence of unrelated tasks, T1, T5, and then the last task, T1 minus, is very much like the first task, but it has much less uh, label data. And so the right thing to do here would be not even try to learn anything, but just transfer knowledge from the first task. But the network has to recognize that the last task is pretty much like the first one. We have a second task where the opposite is true. And so for instance, the last task is pretty much like the first one, but it has much more data. So in this case, the model has to be able to figure out that, you know, it's not worth to transfer much knowledge. You, it's best for you to update your existing knowledge. And so, we define this uh, stream of data, including a stream that has 100 tasks, okay? So it's much longer than what reported in the literature. And so essentially, we come up with a way to evaluate models that is more holistic. And so we have several axes. In the literature, you find average accuracy and forgetting. So average accuracy is at the end of the learning experience, how well do you do on all the tasks that you've seen in the past? and you average across all the tasks. And forgetting is the difference between the accuracy that you got after training on task K versus what you got after uh, at, the, at the end of the, of the stream and you evaluate on task K. So if at the end of the, uh, of the stream, you forgot about task K, you're gonna see a drop of accuracy. And this is what the forgetting uh, reports. Then we have memory and compute efficiency. And then we have a bunch of axes that relate to uh, your ability to transfer, okay? But for the sake of time, let me skip a little this and tell you about another way to learn uh, a modular architecture, which is extremely simple. And so I'm gonna uh, walk you over the steps. Um, so you observe data from task one, you train your transformer or fully connected neural net, it doesn't matter. Then, Data from task two arrives, and what do you do? You take the architecture from task one, you freeze the, the parameters of these modules, these blue blocks, and you perturb it. And there are many ways to perturb it. Here, for instance, I'm going to replace the top module with a randomly initialized module. I'm going to replace the top two modules with randomly initialized modules, and so, so on and so forth. And then I'm going to um, uh, train independently each net, okay? In this case, I'm going to train three neural nets, and I'm going to select the one that gives the best validation uh, accuracy. Okay, so then this is going to be uh, uh, the path uh, that um, data points from task two are going to follow, okay? Then I got data from task three, and then uh, what I do is I feed the validation set of task two through the architecture of task one and task two, I compute the nearest neighbor accuracy in feature space. And let's say that the task two architecture gives me the best uh, accuracy. And then I'm going to perturb the task two architecture. So I'm gonna freeze these modules and perturb as I did before. I train independent neural nets for each uh, uh, perturbation variant. And then I'm going to select the best. And let's say that is the best, okay? And so slowly I grow my architecture by picking the task that is most related to the current task, okay? Perturb that architecture, and then select one point in architecture space that is uh, that works the best. And we have a version that uses reinforce where you don't need to replicate even. And so if you train over time, then you find that this thing grows sublinearly. So this is what you got by training an independent net at every uh, task. And the dashed um, uh, brown line is what you got if you do what I just described in terms of memory. In terms of average accuracy, you find that uh, this uh, dashed brown and green line improve over time. While if you were to train an independent net, you, the accuracy is going to decrease over time because later tasks usually have less data in this uh, stream of data. And so you're, gonna, um, you're not gonna, going to be able to transfer. 
And interestingly, if you compare to an architecture where you don't grow, so like uh, these uh, lines at the bottom, eventually the system doesn't have plasticity and initially you do well, but eventually you do worse and worse as time goes by because you really need to grow capacity to, to learn these uh, very many tasks. Okay, so this, this was just to tell you a little bit about what we did in continual learning. The conclusion is the following. So I think it's very important to think about efficiency in terms of both how many training examples you need to learn as well as compute and memory. And I think that one very good way to be more efficient is to realize that data sets are not static, but you observe as a practitioner or as a theoretician, but also you know, uh, your machine is going to experience a sequence of tasks. And so if you can leverage past experience to, uh, you can do much better. And here is the speculation in this talk, I've been focusing on two ways to leverage this. One is, um, uh, yes, uh, leveraging these data-driven priors and, and the other aspect is compositionality using these modular architectures, but perhaps there are better ways. And uh, with that said, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Akhtar, and you for, uh, for your questions. And um, I'd be happy to take more if you have any. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the talk, Mark Aurelio. Uh, I think we can take some questions if people have them. while people are collecting their questions, I have a question. Okay. So, so in, in this last set of experiments where to decide which architecture to perturb, you do this clustering in feature space before mm -hmm. training. Yeah. Were the results really sensitive to the order of the tasks? Yes, of course they are. Of course they are. I mean, that's the whole point too, right? So um, if we were to... <laughs> If we were to put tasks with small amount of data first and tasks with a lot of data later, then you will find that training an independent net for every task would work pretty much as well. There is very little to transfer. Right. Sorry, I, I meant, you know, you had these two T2, T3, T4, which mm -hmm. didn't have the plus and minus on them, mm -hmm. but which were nonetheless between the T1 plus and T1 minus. And presumably the final architecture used for like T1 plus, you know, did, did something that was dependent on those, which seemingly maybe you didn't care so much about the order of. So it depends on the algorithm. So if you look at uh, this for the, uh, for the model that I described, it really doesn't matter what T2, T3, T4, T5 are, okay? However, the fact that you have a T1 plus here and T1 minus here, that does matter a lot. <laughs> now, a weaker model may be affected by what T2, T3, T4, T5 are, because right. you may have a little bit of interference. In particular, if we start fine tuning, not freezing modules, but fine tuning, then you start having interference. But at the same time, like in this case, you may be able to improve performance on the first task. So, trade-offs. Right. <laughs> That's fair. Okay, thanks. I understand. Uh, maybe one more question. Um, yeah. Does it make sense to ask here whether it's the models are in the like more towards the kernel regime or feature regime? And if, if so, does that make a difference? Um, kernel versus feature? Yeah, I mean, whether your models are, let's say, linearizing or not so much from this theoretical point of view, obviously the models are real world models and not everything will be so clean there, but well, let's maybe from, a, from another, I, I experienced, experimented a bit with the uh, RNNs mm -hmm. training on sequentially on different tasks. Okay. Uh, and I saw that at least in those were mo mostly time models, but um, that for these RNNs, it depended a lot on whether I started with, uh, let's say, large output scaling or small output scaling. I Maybe see. Whether I, I started in the kernel regime or in the 
in the uh, feature team? Uh, I did not. So these are not Ricardo models, right? Um, no, that's, yeah, it's just my background. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I would need to think about it, to, to be frank with you. Maybe follow up with me and we can discuss over emails because we need to better understand a little bit your question. Sorry. Okay. Professor Aurelio, um, room hey, hi. hi. Uh, so I had a question regarding. So in the in the beginning, or it's sort of like midway in the talk, you were talking about um, um, like instead of using mega batches, if we just train it at, uh, if we just wait for the entire data, yeah, the performance we get, and then uh, yeah, the steps that we had, right? So yeah. uh, you said um, yeah, here. So um, over here. Is there an asymptotic analysis or something like you? You've shown a couple of plots after this where you where uh, intermediate update uh, rate has sort of performed better after yeah. after about hundred tasks or so. Uh, yeah. It looks quite similar. So is it like in the in an asymptotic sense? Um, do we get a do we get a similar performance if you keep the same? I mean, talking about a specific size of the network. Um, so the question is asymptotic. So I I don't know. This is a question for you guys. Um, I mean, this is what we found empirically, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that this relates to my answer to uh, Boris' first question. Very much depends on the learning algorithm. So if you do fine tuning as we're doing here, we consistently see that using intermediate rate works better. Yes because you have a little bit more, you're closer to IID, but at the same time, you don't wait, you don't wait until the very end, right? Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, so uh, you, you're talking about asymptotic in terms of number of examples, I assume, right? Yeah, yeah, and what, I, what I mean is, uh, like we were talking about the area under the curve as a metric, right? Mm -hmm. So my question was, if, we, if, if, the, if the number of samples stops at some point and the model, and we essentially freeze the model and then we keep on uh, using the model for, uh, for, uh, for predictions on, mm -hmm. on, on like testing later on. Mm -hmm. So in, in that scenario, if the asymptotic, if in an asymptotic sense, uh, the intermediate uh, or the greedy uh, greedy algorithm does not converge to the to the. Uh, I'm forgetting the name. I'm I just got it lazy, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, so yeah, if yeah. it doesn't if it doesn't converge to that, then um, then for the future predictions, it would actually makes more sense to not have, not 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 be training in steps, right? So that that is why I was concerned. Uh, so if you, so if you don't have enough data, so let's say we were here at 20, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you, um, yeah, I mean, what happened? So, so the ranking between the models really very much depends on whether the models are converged. So if you don't see enough data, then you know, greedy early on is the best. Correct. And then tardy oftentimes is the best at the very end. Absolutely. So you transition between the two yeah. extreme of, of the spectrum from, from greedy to tardy. Uh, great. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, like uh, what I'm concerned with is, is the horizon, like are the sam is it like, is it, are we talking about us or like, is this, problem specific to the scenario where the data keeps on coming and uh, you know it just continues throughout it's not like we, we are stopping at some point and that's mm -hmm. it this is the final network the train network that we have and anything after this is just for just either for the purpose of uh, uh, like the testing like prediction ah uh, i see I, I see i see i see so if we had much more data right these things would, would stay the same you are saying so, yeah, but, but in practice, in practice, what you would have is that uh, if you have more compute at your disposal, more memory, then you would train a much bigger model. Mm -hmm. And then you will get the blue curve that you see on, on the right hand side here. And so you would go lower and lower. But yes, for the same model size, then at some point it stops.
Hmm. So it all depends on the horizon that we have at hand and the samples, the way they are, uh, the way we are receiving them. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. So um, whether a model is big or small depends on how much data you have mm. and the complexity of the task. And you need to keep fixed one variable to vary the other. So here I'm fixing the data set size and varying the model size. Yes. So in, in that sense, I'm exploring that scenario, but you know, I'm, I'm projecting this way, but perhaps that's not the best way to do it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, well, maybe we can thank Mark Riley again. Thanks a lot. I, I really like this model of having the kind of mega batches that, that, fe that, feels, that feels like there might be some theory that's doable. You know, it's like- Please put, let me know. In some simple, you know, I don't know, right? But, <laughs> but at least it's some, something relatively clean where one could like start as opposed to, you know, come analyze BERT. Well, pretty hard, <laughs> so. Yeah, I think it would be very impactful in practice because in practice, that's what we see. And if we can leverage this, I think we would be able to be much more efficient. So I, I think uh, it, it's something worth thinking about. And right. also even how to build a control setting that uh, allows you to, uh, understand this. Uh, it, it's actually very complicated because you know how do you define tax relatedness and and there are so many variables that you have. So it will be very interesting. Anyway, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, everybody. Well, we were supposed to have one more speaker, but he doesn't seem to be here. So I feel I feel we give him an extra minute, and maybe there's some sort of technical difficulties. If he doesn't show up, we'll you know have, we'll try to schedule him some other day. Um, but uh, stick around or go to the gather town to talk to people. Um, I will, once the recording finishes, post it on YouTube with timestamps for the relevant, you know, lectures and things like that. It's all, it's all one large video, as you can tell from today. So, uh, you know, let's, let's just wait around for a minute or two.